Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome to another episode of Faith Unaltered and the Complete Sinner's Guide. I am your host, Tyler Fowler, and I am back for tonight's episode. We have a debate with our own David Russell and our guest, our friend, Roman Catholic apologist, Luis Dezon. Thank you guys for joining us. It is going to be an awesome show. Our debate topic is intercession of the saints. So without further ado, without, without further ado, Louis Dazon is a PhD candidate in the University of Toronto, specializing in comparative religions and biblical studies. He has been a regular guest on the Michael Lofton Show, formerly Reason and Theology, since 2020. He also teaches sacramental preparation classes, including RCIA, First Communion, and Confirmation at a parish in the Archdiocese of Toronto. His hobbies include learning new languages, bird watching, and bicycling. Lewis, thank you for joining us. I am excited to get this debate underway. And in the blue corner, our co-host David Russell is one of the hosts and producers of this show, Faith Unaltered. He is also a master's student at Trinity Bible College and Theological Seminary, majoring in philosophy and apologetics. He has written several articles, appeared on several podcasts, had a blog spot on the Poached Egg website, and was a contributing author of the book, Surviving Corona, Believers and Non-Believers Examine Their Worldview During This Time of Crisis. David, it is a pleasure to host and moderate this debate. I'm excited for you, brother. We are going to get started. Lewis will lead this uh, debate. The guys will both have 20-minute opening statements, followed by a short five-minute rebuttal. Then we'll move into cross-exam. Lewis will question David for 10 minutes. Then David questions Lewis for 10 minutes. Then we're going to do something a little bit different, but a faith and altered specialty. We're going to have a little informal dialogue going on between the two participants and myself. I'm going to be able to jump in on this one and ask clarifying questions and things of that sort. So a little bit different than a formal, a, a true formal debate, uh, but but formal nonetheless. And then we'll end with uh, Lewis giving a two to five minute closing statement, followed it up by David uh, with the last word. So guys, um, oh, by the way, and after that, we will be taking audience questions where Super Chats will have priority. We can't promise we'll get to all the questions but if you send us a super chat by clicking that little dollar sign down there at the bottom of your screen, we will make it a priority and do our best uh, to get to that. Guys, thank you for joining us. This is going to be fun. Is there anything that y'all would like to say uh, before we get started? Lewis, since you are our guest, I will give you the floor first, my friend. Oh, no, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here. It's only my second time being on the show, but, Ooh. you know... If the first one is any indication, I know it's quite the pleasure to be here. So I'm ready to start any time. Okay, right on. <laughs> right on. Yeah, you know, Luis, I just want to thank you and everybody here tonight uh, or today. <laughs> it's usually we usually go I at night. But yeah, I, I just thank everybody that's here and everybody that's watching. I thank you, Luis, for participating and also for, you know, the rescheduling. And I'm sorry, guys, that I'm sick today. So I'm hoping I can be able to read without losing my voice, but we'll see how that goes. I'm here for you guys. I've taken some medicine. I should be okay, but that's all depending on God and medicine and everything else. <laughs> yeah. uh, before I begin, I do have a fan running in the background. It's not too loud from your end, is it? I can't hear no. it at all. I can't hear it at all. Okay, good. Good. It is a pretty hot summer day, so I need to have that thing on. Hey, Circular secret. Day. I got a secret for you, Lewis. I got the same thing going on in my room. So <laughs> I hope you guys can't hear it neither. I got it on low. Uh, but all right, y'all. Lewis, if you're ready, I see you have, you want me to share the screen down here at the bottom? Yep. All and right. you can start my timer now. Okay. So I am representing the Catholic as well as the Orthodox position on the case for the intercession of the saints where i will show on biblical and historical grounds that this is a properly christian practice now as you can see on my introductory slide i have an image on the right hand side this is rachel from the book of genesis uh, the reason why i have an image of rachel here is that she will figure prominently 
in the arguments that I'm about to present. So I want to start off by uh, saying in brief what the Catholic belief is. And instead of saying it in my own words, I would like to quote from Lumen Gentium, which is a document from the Second Vatican Council. So in paragraph 41 of Lumen Gentium, it states the following, quote, being more closely united to Christ, those who dwell in heaven fix the whole church more firmly in holiness. They do not cease to intercede with the Father for us as they prefer the merits which they acquired on earth through the one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. So by their fraternal concern is our weakness greatly helped. So according to the Catechism and Lumen Gentium, uh, the saints intercede for us from heaven and through them they we are assisted in our Christian walk. Now, is this a proper practice or is this an unlawful uh, accretion that has crept into the church over the centuries? My view is that this comes from the earliest uh, ages of the Christian faith and is firmly grounded in um, scripture and tradition. So I'm gonna pursue three lines of evidence here. The first line is the Jewish roots of the practice of the intercession of the saints. This will take up the majority of my presentation. Following that, I will talk about New Testament principles undergirding the intercession of the saints. And finally, we'll look at some early church uh, documents that show how this was believed in practice uh, from a very early period. So let's begin with Jewish roots. And here I wanna start off with a quote from the scholar William Horbury. Um, uh, he has an article called The Cult of Christ and the Cult of the Saints, which talks about the um, Jewish precedent for the cult of the saints. Shout out to Swan Sona for providing this article to me, by the way. He has a really good presentation on this topic, which I highly recommend. Uh, I'll try to do justice to material in the time that I have. But Horbury, in the first page of his article summarizes the case as follows. Angels have long been prominent in inquiry into the origins of the Christ cult, the martyrs and saints rather less so. This is partly because reverence for angels has obvious antecedents in post-exilic Judaism. The cult of martyrs and saints, however, arguably also has some Jewish roots. So Horry talks about how uh, the matrix for uh, the veneration and the intercession of saints uh, comes from Second Temple Judaism. And I will show you some of the primary source documents that from both the biblical and post-biblical periods that show this. The main text that I want to show you comes from the book of Second Maccabees. Now, this now for purposes of our debate, it is not necessary for me to establish the canonicity of Second Maccabees. Uh, although as a Catholic, I do regard this as inspired scripture. Uh, it is only necessary to note that 2 Maccabees is an authentic historical document that uh, details for us the beliefs and practices of Jews in the Maccabean period, which is about 100 to 200 years before the New Testament. So in chapter 15, Judas Maccabeus relates a dream that he had where he saw uh, the high priest Onias, who had died earlier in the book, as well as the prophet Jeremiah, who lived several hundred years uh, previously. <clears throat> so uh, the passage runs as follows. Judas Maccabeus' dream was this. Onias, who had been high priest, a noble and good man, of modest bearing and gentle manner, one who spoke fittingly and had been trained from childhood in all that belongs to excellence, was praying with outstretched hands for the whole body of the Jews. Then likewise a man appeared, distinguished by his gray hair and dignity and of marvelous majesty and authority. And Onias spoke, saying, This is a man who loves the brothers and prays much for the people and the holy city. Jeremiah, the prophet of God. Jeremiah stretched out his right hand and gave to Judas a golden sword, and as he gave it, he addressed him thus. Take this holy sword, a gift of, from God, with which you will strike down your adversaries. Now, a number of commentators on this, both Catholic and non-Catholic, have identified this as an early example of saintly intercession from beyond the grave. For example, the Erdman's commentary on the Bible, which is a Protestant commentary, uh, says the following on this passage. 2 Maccabees 15.12 describes Onias' intercessory activity for the Jews. 
In the vision, Onias introduces another intercessor, a man of age, dignity, and authority, the prophet Jeremiah. Judas is thus supported by the prayers of both a high priest and a prophet, both dead. So in the Second Temple period, this was already a practice that was established among the Jews. Now, it continued to be practiced even after uh, the biblical period had ended. So uh, some might think that this practice may have existed among the ancient Jews, but disappeared later on. Such is not the case. Uh, well into the period of rabbinic Judaism, we see examples of this in a variety of documents. The most well-known rabbinic Jewish source, of course, is the Babylonian Talmud, which was compiled in the 6th century. And in Tractate Sota 34b, we have an example of Caleb <coughs> from the Book of Numbers, who went to the Promised Land with the spies, and according to the Talmud, he actually engaged in what we would regard as uh, asking the deceased for intercession. So Tractate Sota says the following. Caleb held aloof from the plan of the spies and went and prostrated himself upon the graves of the patriarchs, saying to them, My fathers, pray on my behalf that I may be delivered from the plan of the spies. So here we see that he asks for the intercession of the patriarchs um, to assist him. And it's not just the Talmud that records this. A number of Agadic Midrash from the same time period uh, attest to the same belief. Uh, Louis, Louis Ginsburg in Legends of the Jews uh, records a number of these stories. One of the most prominent has to do with Joseph and his deceased mother, Rachel. So this is in volume two, chapter one of Legends of the Jews. This is public domain if anyone wants to look it up themselves. But here we have the following really fascinating story. So this is when Joseph was sold into slavery and is on the way to Egypt. He passes by the grave of Rachel and the following takes place. Joseph hastened to his mother's grave, and throwing himself across it, he groaned and cried, saying, O mother, mother, that didst bear me, arise, come forth and see how thy son hath been sold into slavery, with none to take pity upon him. Arise, see thy son, and weep with me over my misfortune, and observe the heartlessness of my brethren. Awake, O mother, rouse thyself from thy sleep, rise up and prepare for the conflict with my brethren who stripped me even of my shirt and sold me as a slave to merchantmen who in turn sold me to others and without mercy they tore me away from my father arise accuse my brethren before god and see whom he will justify the judgment and whom he will find guilty arise o mother awake from thy sleep see how my father is with me in his soul and in his spirit and comfort him and ease his heavy heart the amazing thing isn't just that Joseph prays to his mother, but that his mother actually replies back. So Rachel from beyond the grave speaks to her son, and we read it in the following words. Then he heard a voice heavy with tears speak to him from the depths, saying, My son Joseph, my son, I heard thy complaints and thy groans. I saw thy tears, and I knew thy misery, my son. I am grieved for thy sake, and thy affliction is added to the burden of my affliction. But, my son Joseph, put thy trust in God, and wait upon him. Fear not, for the Lord is with thee, and he will deliver thee from all evil. Go down into Egypt with thy masters, my son. Fear not, for the Lord is with thee, O my son. This and much more like unto it did he, the voice utter, and then it was silent. So, Rachel figures prominently in the rabbinic Jewish tradition as someone whose intercession is sought after, uh, based on this story. Uh, in Hasidic Judaism, uh, it is believed that her grave is actually a powerful place of intercession, and many Jews to this day continue to visit it. So in Chabad.org, which is the one-stop uh, source for all things Hasidic, there's an article called Why God Listens to Rachel, and this is what it says there. Consider what this mother gave up so that she could become the one to intercede on behalf of her children. She had lost her husband in life. Rachel, lonely in life and in the afterlife, is utterly selfless and wholly devoted. In life, she set herself aside for her sister. In the afterlife, she set her interests aside for her children. That is a true mother. That is why God pays attention to her entreaties. So even in modern Judaism, this practice still exists today. More generally, uh, Hasidic Jews believe that you can ask uh, deceased holy men to pray on your behalf. So there is a uh, Another article from the same website titled, Is it okay to ask a deceased tzaddik to pray on my behalf? I will not uh, quote the whole 
uh, article here, suffice to say the answer is yes, you can. And it is considered um, efficacious to do so. So now we see that Second Temple Judaism and up to modern Judaism considers intercession of the saints a lawful belief and practice. But what about the New Testament? Does Christianity actually take over this practice? Now, Protestants will argue that there are no uh, specific examples of intercession of the saints in the New Testament. But as every Christian, Catholic, and Protestant knows, even if something is not explicitly stated in the New Testament, we can still see something as biblical by way of good and necessary influence. So there are three New Testament principles that point to intercession of the saints. The first principle is that all believers, whether in heaven or on earth, are alive in Christ and part of the communion of saints. The second principle is that the saints in heaven are aware of what is happening on earth and are praying for us. The third principle is that the saints, being perfectly sanctified, have more efficacious prayers than our own. So let's go through each principle, shall we? The first one, all believers, whether in heaven and earth, are alive in Christ and part of the communion of saints. So the communion of saints refers to every believer, both on earth and in heaven. So we are all collectively the saints. And this comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. A lot of Protestants think that this merely means that uh, the saints the Old Testament saints furnish an example for us, but the language is far stronger than that. Uh, the verb perikeme uh, in the Greek means to be located around some object or area, to be around or to surround. So the saints actually uh, watch us from heaven uh, the same way spectators at a sports event look on as the athletes compete. And as we know, uh, spectators are never passive. They are cheering on their team of choice. And this leads us to the second principle. The saints in heaven are aware of what is happening on earth and are praying for us. How many times have you heard a Protestant say, the saints are too busy worshiping God in heaven to pay attention to what's happening on earth? This is an unbiblical concept. We know that the saints are very much concerned with what happens on earth. In the book of Revelation, we have many references to the bowls of incense that represent the prayers of the saints. These are presented by the angels before God. So we know that uh, the prayers of the saints are accepted by God in heaven. Uh, but does this refer to the saints in heaven? We have an explicit reference to them in Revelation 6, verses 9 to 10. And I'll quote the whole passage here. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves have been. So the saints in heaven, not only are they aware of what is going on on earth, they are concerned about it, and they are asking God to intervene uh, in, on their behalf uh, towards those who are still on earth. So we see that there is a connection between the saints on earth and the saints in heaven that goes beyond mere spectation. And finally, the third principle, the saints being perfectly sanctified have more efficacious prayers than our own. And the main text for this is James 5, verses 14 to 18. I'll begin by quoting the first half. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, you'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So according to St. James, the prayer of the elders of the church are especially efficacious because they have, are bestowed with a certain sanctity that the average member of the church ne doesn't necessarily have. So here we see that not all prayers are weighted equally. It gets stronger as we go along in verse 16 b to 18 it says the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit 
So St. James points to the prophet Elijah as an example of someone whose prayers are especially powerful. Now, how do we apply this to the saints? Um, think of the following syllogism, okay? So the first premise in the syllogism is, the more righteous a person is, the more efficacious your prayers are. We just saw that that is the case in James 5. The second premise, <clears throat> those in heaven being perfectly sanctified are much more righteous than those still on earth. We can reasonably infer this from what the Bible teaches regarding sanctification and glorification. And when we take these two premises together, <clears throat> we get to the conclusion, therefore, the prayers of those in heaven are much more efficacious than the prayers of those on earth. If we take these three principles together, we have a good biblical grounding for belief in the intercession of the saints. But <clears throat> how far back does this practice actually go? If we look at the patristic period, we have very early attestation for this practice, going at least as far back as the third century. So I'll show you the quotes uh, from a number of early church fathers that attest this practice. Clement of Alexandria in his Traumata, which was written around the early uh, third century, says the following. So is he, the true, tr true Christian, always pure for prayer. He always prays in the society of angels as being already of angelic rank. And he is never out of their holy keeping. And though he pray alone, he has the choir of the saints standing with him. So according to St. Clement, the saints all pray alongside the believer on earth. When we get to later in the third century, this practice becomes stronger. Uh, in the Roman catacombs, for example, uh, we see uh, writings on the walls uh, where Saints Peter and Paul are asked for their intercession on behalf of those who are still on earth. And then a number of mid-third century fathers speak to this practice. Origen, in his um, treatise on prayer, says the following. It is not only the high priest who prays, but those who truly pray but also the angels who have joined heaven upon one sinner that doth penance, more than upon ninety-nine just who need not penance, and also the souls of the saints who have passed away. Likewise, St. Cyprian of Carthage in Epistles 56 says the following, Let us remember one another in concord and unanimity. Let us on both sides of death always pray for one another. Let us relieve burdens and afflictions by mutual love. And then finally, one of my favorite quotes from the third century. Um, as you know, uh, of all the saints that are in heaven, none uh, is, is entreated more frequently than the Theotokos, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Both Catholic and Orthodox traditions have a strong tradition of uh, seeking the intercession of the Blessed Mother. And this goes all the way back to the third century. In the earliest attested Marian prayer, Sub Tuum Presidium, we have the following. And I have the original Greek text as well as the English translation. So I'll just read the English text where it says, Under thy compassion we take refuge, Theotokos. Do not disregard our prayers in the midst of tribulation, but deliver us from danger, O only pure, only blessed one. So as early as the third century, we had Christians asking for the intercession of the Theotokos. And this shows us that this is the constant practice of the early church, which it takes from the New Testament and from ancient Judaism. So in conclusion, is the intercession of the saints a properly Christian practice? I say yes. And we see that these three lines of evidence converge to give us a full picture of why we can regard it as a truly Christian practice. Thank you very much. Right on, Lewis, with 23 seconds to go. Awesome. That was good. All right, David, are you ready, sir? Yes, sir. All right, let me get this timer reset. And then... Hold on one you... second, guys. Yeah, yeah. Just And just so our... Me. Just so while, while you're getting ready, David, I'll make the Ooh. announcement to our no, audience okay. uh, that we... So all of us have agreed... Uh, off of air that because David's sick, if he gets into a coffin fit, we're going to uh, pause the timer, <laughs> let him get what he needs to get out of the way, and then we'll restart. And so 
I think you're doing pretty good though, right, David? Um, as of now, yeah. Okay. Everything's feeling all right. I don't feel like I'm going to have to, but when you right. start reading an opening statement, then you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. All right. Uh, since I soloed uh, Lewis's thing, uh, I'll solo you whenever you start speaking. I'll start the timer, brother. All righty. Go ahead. Today, I am going to take the Protestant position on the intercession of the saints. I am going to concede right now. <laughs> uh, do the saints pray for us in heaven? Yeah, they probably do. There you go, Luis. You win the debate right now. <laughs> but I just, I mean, I think today this topic is so broad, it's really hard to narrow down one thing of what it means to have intercession of the saints or to participate in intercession of the saints. So do those brothers and sisters that go before us seem to intercede for, for those still on earth? I mean, I can understand why people uh, think they do. Um, I, I hope my mom isn't, you know, quiet in heaven, you know. <laughs> um, my interlocutor tonight, oh, yeah. So, like, I, yeah, my interlocutor in a previous discussion said, and I paraphrase, Revelation 6 seems to seal the deal, but does it? Should we really be deriving our theology about this subject um, out of apocalyptic passages? Um, what actually is the meaning of intercession of the saints? Most Catholics that I have come into contact with um, don't mind the language of praying to the saints, while others rather call it praying with the saints, like the Hallowat, for example. The Eastern Orthodox I have met travel along similar veins as a Semitic range of words that describe the practice doesn't bother them. However, when you look more into this practice, you can see it as a both and for example the catholic company tells believers to invoke their saint like this call your saint and ask your petition saying something like for the intercession of your saint here ask your petition here finish your prayer with our father the hail mary and the glory be the arch the arlington diocese tells us tells its adherents which is in my state o almighty and eternal father Giver of all gifts, show us mercy, show us your mercy, and grant we beseech you through the merits of your faithful servant, St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, that all who invoke her intercession may obtain what they desire according to the good pleasure of thy holy will. While dictionaries vary, most have a definition for this specific context. They say, call out a deity or spirit in prayer as a witness or for inspiration. With these examples and definitions in mind, I will take to the position that I do not think Christians should be praying with or invoking saints. To demonstrate my position, I will address major key points that call into question the practice ranging from topics like the historicity of invoking venerating saints and those that have gone before, what the scripture actually says about invoking the dead on behalf of the living, and finally, what prayer is and is not. Finally, since this topic is rather large and broad, I will be going through some of the points Lewis brought up in our last conversation we had on Faith and Altered. One of the first things Lewis brought up concerning the Jewishness of praying to the saints involved a, or a deceased loved one comes from a 20th century German work called The Legends of the Jews. He quoted the story of Joseph going to the grave of his mother, Rachel, and beseeching her for help and intercession. In the story, Rachel tells Joseph to trust the Lord and that the Lord is with him. Tyler, at this point, posed a question to him concerning if this constituted necromancy. Luis responded, saying, if we are to use rabbinic tradition to shed light on how these passages are understood, it is clear that not all Jews thought seeking this kind of intercession was a form of necromancy. And this is true, depending on what era you might be looking into. However, an article written by Savi Freeman states, yet for as long as there are records, Jews have been in the habit of asking the righteous men and women to have a chat with God on their behalf. According to Freeman, <laughs> these records clearly are older than Deuteronomy 18, 11, and 12, which states, let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination and sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist who consults the dead. 
anyone who does the, these things is detestable to the Lord because of these same detestable practices, the Lord, your God, will drive out those nations before you. Or Isaiah 8, 19, 20. And when they say to you, inquire of mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? No, to the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Sorry, I had somebody pass in front of me. <laughs> um, if I leave the wording there because it is serious. Isaiah in particular, due to the nature of the objection, objective standard, he then purports in claiming the teaching and the testimony, i.e. what is already written and established. This is exactly what the historical problem is that I am here to address. If rabbinic teaching violates what a what is written in the law or the prophets, the tradition is to be disregarded. Shedding light on tradition doesn't establish whether that tradition is good or true. Matter of fact, it isn't truly known where this tradition comes in. We know there are many places in which Israel comes into contact with pagan nations where they erred and floundered in idolatrous practices. In fact, the tradition of praying to the deceased is utterly foreign to the Old Testament and shows up in apocryphal writings after Hellenization. To demonstrate this further, the Legends of the Jews by Louis Ginsburg cite uh, Louis Ginsburg cites from the Genesis Rabbah the story Louis quotes. Ginsburg himself compiled these stories in the 20th century and did not quote the Midrashim once, but paraphrased and rewrote these four volumes in a continued narrative. The actual story of Joseph and Rachel at Rachel's tomb is thought to be from the Apocryphal book of Jasher. The problem is we have no idea what is actually written in Jasher, but what comes from the Old Testament. And that exists in two quotes. Plus, according to sacred text, and I quote, there are several, as many as five separate works by this title, all composed much later than biblical times. But with such a flimsy source, let's talk about the rabbinic tradition of praying to the deceased, deceased for intercessions. This is a rabbinic tradition that some sects practice, as mentioned before, but when the issue, which is called Doresh El Hanatum, comes up, it is usually contested. Many commentators call this practice forbidden. The Rabban, the Bach, Miriam Mintz, and many more. Sefer Hamarut similarly explains that according to the later Talmudic tradition, in which he holds, petitions to the dead are forbidden. So this brings up the problem of looking to rabbinic tradition to shed light on cultural beliefs. In this case, when the plain and primary source speaks against a certain tradition that you hold, you should always go with what is written. Consider this from Michael Dr. or Dr. Michael Brown. What does the Torah itself teach? One, God gave Moses his commands and laws. Two, Moses wrote down in a book everything the Lord said to him. Three, Moses and the words that this book uh, of the people are the uh, that Moses read the words of the book to the people and based on the words of that book, the covenant was made. Read key, the key verses for yourself. It was a, it was this book of the law, Sefer Torah, that was to be read by the king, and Israel would be judged based on what was written in the book. That is why God told Joshua not to let the book of the law depart from his lips, and that's why every single reference in the Bible to the Torah or the teaching of Moses refers to what is written. Every single time the, Bi the Hebrew Bible refers to the law and the teaching of Moses, Torah, Torah Moshe, um, it is reference, referring, uh, referring to the written Torah every single time. If what is said by Moses and Isaiah, law and prophet, is to be replaced by certain sects, um, or what certain sects came to believe on the matter, which is clearly a development and accretion, if rabbinic tradition can override the clear, plain teaching of that Jesus held the Jewish leaders in the same in his time to account, why should I then hold anything Scripture says? No, I'll stick to Jesus and the Scriptures, which is also your guys's prima, if I'm not mistaken. So we come to the practice today. As I already demonstrated, this practice is highly contested by both scripture and rabbinic teaching. 
Next, why is there still veneration and prayers going on? Did something change between the Testament? Did the coming of the of Jesus allow us to have an image we could now make icons and statues of? And does that extend to those that are in that are in Christ that are also at rest? Well, again, you have a problem here if this was the case. God appeared physically to people before Moses ever wrote the law about images. To say something changed because of Jesus is saying that Moses is wrong about the prohibition in the first place. Abraham saw him uh, visibly, and yet the stall, law still went in effect at Sinai. Does the New Testament offer passages that explicitly tell us how, uh, how to pray to saints or deceased loved ones or that we can now do so because they are indeed alive in Christ? No. Even the Catholic Catechism recognizes them that it's not explicit in the New Testament. The next key point I want to address deals with the practices early development of the Christian church. The earliest manuscript that we have is one that uh, Luis brought up earlier, the Subtumum Presidium. And he read it, uh, or I don't know if he read it or not, but this ancient prayer of Mary comes 200 years after Christ. Although earliness is high, its earliness is highly contested, and I do have references if you need it, um, it doesn't reflect anything handed down from us from the eyewitnesses. We also know at this time Gnosticism is in full play, along with other influences coming along and impacting the early church. But even earlier than this, we know the apostle Paul addresses a proto-Gnostic sect in Colossians 2.18, which is uh, a teaching uh or he says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels, um, going on in detail about visions. Dr. Jordan Cooper points out that we that we see people trying to worship angels already early on. And when you have synopticism and Gnosticism, this gives way to the idea of intermediary beings between God and the uncreated and the created realm with levels of beings in between that bridge the gap between God and us. Not to mention, you even see the beloved disciple get things wrong when he bows down and worships an angel in Revelation. The point is we can't base our theology of prayer on anything other than what Scripture tells us. We have no evidence in the New Testament that we ought to pray to anyone else but God. For the first 200 years of the church, we have no mention of praying to saints. It is only after these influences infiltrate the church that we see the doctrine begin to develop. There is also no mentions of prayers in any of the early apostolic uh, fathers. Ignatius, Polycarp, Irenaeus, and Justin Martyr. For one example, we see Irenaeus say, nor does she, the church, perform anything by means of angelic invocations or by incantations or by any other wicked curious art, but directing her prayers to the Lord who made all things in pure, in a pure, sincere, and straightforward spirit and calling upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. She has a custom to work miracles on the behalf of man. All this to show that it's most likely a development that, that comes along, and many Catholics are fine with that. Consider Cardinal Newman. He insists instead that it is possible for doctrine to develop and for there to arise statements expressed for the first time without these counting as new revelation. Another interesting thing to mention is how this doctrine develops to uh, and looks like characteristics of the pantheonic gods of Rome and Greece. You see saints becoming patrons of all sorts of things. Cupid, known as the god of love. Now we have St. Valentine filling those shoes. We even have a patron saint of sports, and according to Catholic.org, this is his prayer. St. Sebastian, patron saint of athletes and sports, help me to do my best that I can aim high, and always give my best effort. And if I should fail, give me strength to try harder. Amen. And again, we need to talk about the type of veneration given to the saints too. I have been mostly quiet on that front. Scripture does give us particular examples of praise for certain people, however. There is no act of veneration, though, that involves prayer. Catholics often mention, uh, mention the distinction between Latria and Dulia. And although I think the lexical differentiation is disproved by the Old Testament itself, I do want to mention that it is because the semantic domain of both words regarding religious worship come together and are used synonymously within the context of what Avad means in Exodus 25, which comes us to us in that way in the New Testament as well. I do not want to continue to beat that dead horse. Plenty of people have talked about it, but if anyone wants 
I could provide evidence for it. The fact is that we see from our EO and RC brothers is not what should be taking place. We should not be bowing down, kissing images or statues or praying to saints. The main reason I say that is because these are indicative of other religions and not the unique Christian religion. First and foremost, prayer should not even involve anyone else but God. In this final section, I want to argue that our theology of prayer should come from the Bible. Catholics like Louise say that prayers to the saints can be found in Revelations chapter 5, 6, and 8. Specifically, in chapter 5, we read, And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the four 24 elders fell down before the land, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The first thing, again, to be careful with is developing a theology of prayer from apocalyptic verses that require all sorts of assumptions in its interpretation. Revelation is a highly symbolic book. If our prayers are taken by these elders never says they are saints, by the way, and given and given to God, are angels also receiving the wrath of God's God in bowls to be poured out as in Revelations 14, I believe. Um, or is there a reason John wrote Revelation this way? Is it in fact that incense is something that the first century audience would have understood? Incense refers to any type of plant material, such as spices or herbs that are burned and to produce a sweet aroma through its smoke. In Exodus 30, God instructs Moses to prepare an altar of incense in the tabernacle where priests uh, would burn incense regularly. God says in Exodus 38 that these plans are so incense will burn regularly before the Lord for generations to come. Throughout the biblical times, priests faithfully burn incense in temples. King David prays in Psalms 141 too, as well, um, may my prayer be set for you, before you like incense. So incense is symbolic of how God's of of how people's prayers like a sweet are like a sweet fragrance rising up to God. The prayers of the saints and revelations are connected with incense, showing that those prayers which reach God in heaven in ways that he treasures. In Revelation 6, are we to or do we to believe that glorified saints sharing the nature of Christ are crying out to be avenged? We know that they are taking on uh, we know that they are taking on the image of Christ. Should not um, our cry not be to forgive instead of avenge? No, I do believe there's something deeper going on here. There's a deeper meaning. And that is um, the martyrs that underwent the persecution are at rest and that justice is delayed, but with a surety of justice or judgment coming. Again, you can't get your theolo theology of prayer from Revelation. Otherwise, you end up believing that partaking in God's nature is akin, akin to being able to be ascribed divine attributes. Do saints now have a nature that gives them the ability to hear every prayer uttered to them in different languages? <laughs> Can they create planets at some point? To that, I just say, harken back to the third chapter of Genesis, where Eve thought that by eating fruit, she'd be like God. Prayer specific, it is pointed all throughout scripture. It is defined as a petition given to given to God uh, or an object of worship. Why? Because true prayer is the distilled essence of worship. It is humankind's verbalization of worship, confession, thanksgiving, and requests to the Father. Many lexical aids and more specifically, Little and Scott, define the Greek word, prosca, I don't even know how to say it, prosekumui, <laughs> uh, offer, offer, Offers of prayer and worship. Even the Wells Catechism, page 290, question 329, ask, what is prayer? Their answer is, prayer is an act of worship in which we speak to God from our hearts. Throughout scripture, every single and every single example of prayer is directed at God alone. In fact, Jesus is asked how we should pray, and his answer involves worship and who to address. The echo resounds, my friends. I need I need you to forgive me. I need you to feed me. I need you to protect me, for you are the Holy One. I hope I have demonstrated this position well today. Thank you, guys. And I am done, and I'm about to cough majorly. <laughs> you did good at not coughing. So you can see it a minute. You, there's nothing else you want to say? Okay. All right, guys. That concludes our opening statements. So great job, both of you.
And we are on to our five minute rebuttals. So let me set my timer. Oh, and... before you do that, I just want to say sorry to everybody. If I couldn't read everything correctly, it's hard to read when you're congested like this. So I hope everything was clear. It happens. All right, yeah. Lewis, I'm ready uh, to start the timer when you start. So speaking. before you start, I just want to turn my share screen on again. Yeah, yeah I of have course. my Verbum app up because I feel it's easier to discuss text when you have them on the screen. So uh, you can start my timer now. So I want to start off by restating uh, some elements of the Catholic position in response to what David says. First of all, I want to mention the fact that as Catholics, we do agree that divination and necromancy are abominable practices. The Catechism uh, states no less in 2116, where it says, all forms of divination are to be rejected, recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead, or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future. So we agree that divination is a necromancy or evil. Where we disagree is what constitutes divination and necromancy. Now, do the passages in the Old Testament just quoted uh, mean go against the practice that I've stated. Let's take a closer look at some of these texts, shall we? So the main text that our friend David quoted was Isaiah 8, 19, uh, where it says, and when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? I think we need to clarify what mediums and necromancers are. So the relevant words in Hebrew are ovot and yidonim. So Brown Driver Briggs describes an ov as someone who uh, seeks the dead for instruction, and that probably has something to do with ventriloquism. So an ov is trying to obtain information from beyond the grave by illicit means. A yidoni functions in roughly the same way. So yidoni actually comes from the Hebrew verb yada, means to know. So a yidoni tries to obtain knowledge um, from the dead. So here we see a difference between intercession of the saints and necromancy because the person who, in, who asks for the intercession of the saints isn't trying to obtain information from the saints, although God may choose to divulge that information if he chooses to. Instead, we are asking the saints to go to God on our behalf. So the uh, purpose is different. Moreover, uh, we would be in trouble if every single instance of communicating with the dead counted as necromancy because that means that the gospels have instances of necromancy in them. Think of the transfiguration, Matthew 17, where Jesus is speaking to Moses and Elijah who are up on the mountain. Think of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus where um, the man who is suffering in uh, the worst part of Sheol is asking for Abraham's intercession. He even asked Abraham to send um, Moses to warn his still living brothers. Interestingly, Abraham never says that you that it's impossible for Moses to go up. He merely says that even if he did, it would not convince them. Now, go, moving forward to the New Testament passages, I want to ask Tyler, why can't we, sorry, not Tyler, David, um, uh, why can't we use Revelation to derive our theology of the saints? After all, Revelation is one of the clearest pictures that we have of what goes on in the next life. In there, we see how heaven operates. We see what the glorified saints are doing uh, up there. And this is the best window that we have. And they do point to the saints being concerned with what happens to us. So I think it is fair to say that we should look at uh, Revelation to know what the saints are doing. And some of the arguments that David says on using the Bible to form a theology, if we take them to their logical conclusion, they would prove too much. Uh, for example, if we are merely to use language the way the Bible uses it, we can't derive a properly Trinitarian theology. For example, after all, uh, we say that God is one usia and three hypostases, but the Greek New Testament never uses the term usia and upostasis in that way. Uh, the words do occur, but the way they're used is totally different. And we can't 
use the Lord's Prayer as a way to delimit uh, how we should pray, because if we use that argument to its logical conclusion, not only can we not pray to the saints, we can't even pray to the other um, persons of the Trinity. After all, Jesus never told us to pray to him, and we have no example in the New Testament of prayers to the Holy Spirit. Uh, finally, in my remaining 15 seconds, I noticed that most of uh, David's arguments regarding the early church are arguments from silence. Uh, the problem with arguments from silence is they can run both directions. Uh, even if the early church fathers uh, prior to the second century never quoted, never mentioned a practice, that doesn't mean it was not present. And I can argue the opposite, that uh, the fact that they don't argue against it means that they approve of it. And that's all I have to say. That's it. All right. Uh, good job, Lewis. Uh, David, you are up, my friend. And thank you for the man. I'm going to butcher this name. So if any of y'all know it, please correct me. Uh, but Jib just sent us a five dollar super chat. We will get to that first whenever we get to the audience uh, Q&A. But uh, David, let me set my timer real quick like. All right. I am ready to go. I'll start the timer whenever you start speaking, sir. Five minutes. Yes, I, I notice I didn't get an answer about the Jewish roots and traditions here uh, um, that we cited earlier. He didn't address my opening in that regard. So um, I do want to say that uh, what he did uh, address, like Sota 34, there are several other people that don't talk about that because they don't think that that Asiatic text actually um, has that much authority. Um, also, he quotes... Uh, um, James on Elijah, but again, um, it's not about Elijah was actually here on earth um, praying. So, I mean, I don't know where this falls into his notion of the whole merits that we don't have these that were in weakness here because Elijah was in weakness, yet it still didn't rain. Um, he quoted some things about uh, problems in the New Testament with Jesus and the transfiguration. Again, there's no praying to saints there. Jesus is also transfigured. So I think that's kind of comparing apples and oranges. The rich man and Lazarus, again, he has to kind of assert that this, this allows for prayers to the saints, which it doesn't. It does actually say that... Um, Abraham didn't actually do it. He just went away. You know, he's like, no, if they don't believe what is written, which is the whole point of my argument tonight, then they're not going to get it. So, you know, we get all these different examples throughout the, the whole New Testament, not to mention that an argument from silence is not a it doesn't mean that uh is, is doesn't mean that they're silent. I mean, we do have examples of who to pray to. They pray to the Lord thy God, right? And he said that they could, we can't get a clear definition of prayer throughout the Bible, but Jesus teaches us exactly how we should pray. So, I mean, I, I really don't know if 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 that if that's a really good response there, but I think that's all I got to say because I really didn't get to prepare a rebuttal today because it was last minute and we we're going off of assumptions of what we might say. And you guys didn't really, <laughs> he didn't really have what I thought he would say. So I, I didn't get much time to prepare there, but I do think that there's problems with uh, him making those assumptions about the Bible there. So you, are you conceding the rest of your time, Dave? You got two minutes, 38 seconds. If you want to say anything else, brother. yeah, no, I'm good, bud. Okay. All right. Um, also, David, uh, just for our audience sake, uh, whenever you turn away, we can barely uh, hear really what hear you're me? saying. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. guys. No, you're good. You're good. Just keep that in mind. Um, all right. So that ends the rebuttal section. Uh, we're going to move on to our 10 minute cross exam. So again, for our audience sake, we're going to have two sections of 10 minutes. Um, so Lewis will question David. And then after that 10 minutes is up, David will question Lewis. And then we're going to move into an informal dialogue. And I'm telling you guys, this is where I'm going to get most of my questions. I've got a couple, but y'all are doing so good, man. Uh, I, I haven't been able to, to nail anything uh, down for either one of you. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. But Lewis, let me, uh, let me set my timer. And uh, you... Hold on, just, just to clarify, who's asking who in the first round? You, you can go. Yeah, you will be asking David questions, and then yeah. in the next round, David will ask you questions. Right. All right, okay. I'll start the timer when you start speaking, sir. All right, so I do have a number of questions relating to some of your points. 
Um, let's start with hermeneutics, okay? Because it seems to me we read the Bible differently. Um, in the Westminster Confession, it says, The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. So my first question is, do you agree with the Westminster Confession that things that are not expressly stated in Scripture may be deduced from it by good and necessary consequence? Um, I don't know what that has to do with the topic tonight. <coughs> but, it, um, it's uh, um, it's related. Or today. I'm gonna but so I, I oh yeah, and that's the thing. I, I I'm not gonna allow you to lead uh, like that. So um, yeah. if you have a question um, uh, regarding the topic, I will uh, address it if it's having to do with prayers to the saints and intercessions. I'm not. I don't have the Westminster Confession right here in front of me to be able to answer right. that. Uh, my, my basic question is, do you believe that we can derive a practice from Scripture by way of inference, even if it's not expressly stated? Again, um, I would say yes. Yes. To, to, All right. To so, allow this to go on. Go. All right. So on the topic of prayer, would you say then that we can derive principles for how to pray from scripture that aren't necessarily explicit instructions on how we should pray. Um, I believe that the New Testament is sufficient in giving us tons of examples on how to pray. And because they give us those examples, we should follow those type of formulas. So I right. think that uh, the New Testament is sufficient in doing that. So I don't know what you're getting at and how this involves prayer to the saints. I know you're probably leading up to okay. something, but can you, do you believe that we can pray to all three persons of the Trinity? I usually don't even think about it. All right. So, you know, uh, I'm I, assuming I, we're all yeah. Christians here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so would you be okay with saying a prayer that's addressed to the Holy Spirit? I, 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 the way I, I do my prayer life is really not relevant to praying and how to pray to saints. So I'm just okay. going to skip on that one, buddy. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to be a jerk, but <laughs> I want to know. I want, you know, I want pointed <clears throat> questions that have to do with prayers to the saints. Exactly. Not let's lead up to this and get a, I gotcha moment, you know? Okay. So. Would it be fair to say that Scripture nowhere uh, explicitly says that we should pray to the Holy Spirit? Would that be a fair statement in your regard? Um, okay, you're going to keep going down this line. Uh, sorry, buddy. I, I, I just I, I don't know what you're getting at, so I don't even know how this is relevant. Um, I know you're trying to make a point that, you know, uh, we could pray to – we could derive how to pray – differently instead of just using the scripture but i don't think that a, 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 you know is gives us justification and or warrant to pray to saints well here's the point that i'm trying to make okay is Thank you. <laughs> it possible that we can derive we, we can know how we should pray from scripture based on inference even if scripture doesn't furnish us with an explicit example that we should pray this way Okay, so Lewis, I, I think we've got, again, I think we have plenty of examples of how we should pray, and I do think that our early church apostolic fathers tell us who to direct our prayers at. So, yeah, okay. I do hold that how we can pray. I don't think I can do like, I, I mean, at least I don't practice in my personal life. I don't wake up and say, oh, dear Holy Spirit, thank you for this day. I start with a, a, a formula that addresses uh, God the Father. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's move on to a different line of argumentation then. So let's talk about uh, the Old Testament and Judaism. So you cited Isaiah chapter 8, where it talks about um, mediums and necromancers. In your view, what constitutes necromancy? Necromancy, as far as that I read from all the biblical uh, commentators and definitions, and lexical aids that I use uh, of is simply consulting the dead, plain and simple. Consulting the dead. Yeah. Are all forms that's the of first. That's uh, hold on. Uh, and I'm not going to say that's the only definition. There are the ones that you cited that also refer to trying to gain information. However, it, mm -hmm. it, it does 
encompass all of that. All right. So is it your view then that all forms of communication with the dead count as necromancy? That could be seen as very as, as very much, and that's that is actually debated in ancient Judaism. So, mm-hmm. and I, I listed that in my opening statement of who actually thought that it yeah. violated Dorash El Hamatan. And you could probably okay. say that better than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, if God chose to allow um, someone in heaven to communicate with someone on earth, does that still count as necromancy? Can you ask that again? If God chose to allow someone on earth to commun- uh, someone on heaven in heaven to speak with someone on earth, does that still count as necromancy? If God because allows it's already it, God if God allowing. allows it, I mean, that's not. Again, this is really doesn't have to do with the entirety of the Dagon praying the saints. But um, I understand your point, what you're leading to. Um, I would say God wouldn't go against His word. So if, mm-hmm. if that were to happen, I would say that that's probably not something that God would allow. So I would probably discredit it from the, from, from right off. So I'm, I'm not sure, uh, it, you know, if that applies. So why did God allow it during the transfiguration? Why did God allow what during the transfer transfiguration? Well, Jesus, I think it's bad. Him. I think it's bad to, again, I think citing the transfiguration is, is, is a, is comparing apples to oranges. I mean, Moses and Elijah were there to represent the law and prophets. What we don't get out of that passage is that Peter and and uh, and the three that were with Jesus, okay, um, are uh, praying or are, are talking to to Elijah and Moses at all. Jesus is, and the whole point is God's coming out proclaiming who Jesus is, and He is transformed. There's a lot going on there, and I don't think you that that it. it it's it's very comparable mm. to things like that. I mean, Jesus so, was it was transferred in glory at that point. Hypothetically, if Peter had spoken to Moses and Elijah, would Peter have been engaging in necromancy? Um, I don't think that's very relevant to the topic because it's he didn't do it. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to play a what if game. Okay. Okay. So. It, it all leads up to it. But you okay. say we can't use the transfiguration. Uh, is it your view then the transfiguration is meant to be a one-off occurrence? A, a one-off occurrence? Well, it was a one-off occurrence. It only happened once. We only got a record of it happening once. So, I mean, it, it, yeah. So, I mean, next question. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, you say uh, in Judaism this was a contested issue. Okay, got two minutes left. Uh, when do you have any ideas of like how uh, how and when this practice entered into ancient Judaism? Um, I don't think any of us have a direct date. I don't think you guys have a direct date. I don't think we any of us have a direct date of when this actually infiltrated. Um, I believe that you could start seeing it um, during during the period of where Jews began to being in, impacted by Greek culture and so forth during Hellenization. Mm-hmm. So, and that's a long process. And even you said before, Luis, that uh, Second P- Temple Judaism is uh, is very diverse. So I can't say that, oh, this is a, a wide or a mainstream practice at the time, because it's obviously not. It's debated, and it's actually rejected in the later Talmudic traditions. And so is Second Maccabees affected by hellenistic uh religious oh, ideas a- absolutely i mean we get ideas that it was originally written in greek so i mean this is debated you know this is Isn't constantly that, debated, and that... it's an apocryphal work so i don't even hold it as reliable as authoritative as more authoritative but i also see a lot of things the maccabees mm-hmm. did wrong in in within the, the text mm-hmm. itself but i don't know if that has answered your question at all my friend doesn't that sort of defeat the whole ideology of Second Maccabees? After all, it's all about the supremacy of Judaism versus Hellenism. No, I don't, because you still get, you, you know, as far as Scripture goes, you see the the bad and the ugly along with the the good and the uh, along with the good. Yeah. You see them what they do wrong and what they do right. You know, mm-hmm. um, the Bible is a messy story of people. You know that mm-hmm. <laughs> do all sorts of things. So even in those. Uh, um, the, there's, uh, you know, the Deuterocanonical stories, you see history there. So, I mean, I agree with you on a lot of what you said about uh, um, it actually being a historical source. I mean, I would never say that, but 
Um, oh, sorry. You can, you can finish your statement, David. No, 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 I'm good. Okay. I think I, ma- I made my point. Luce, did you get my point there? Uh, yeah, to an extent. I don't think I agree with the point, but I see where you're trying to go with it. Okay. All right, guys. Good job. Good job. All right, David, you are up and I am ready to go. So you start speaking. I'll start the timer. By the way, for our audience, if you would like to, once we get done with this segment of the debate, we're going to move into the informal dialogue section. At that time, if you want to start asking questions, which we have got questions coming in already, Thank you for those. Uh, but there's a lot of chat going on in the uh, in the live chat as well that doesn't have anything to do with questions. And so if you would, please put either Faith Unaltered uh, or at CSG or at the Complete Center's Guide, probably CSG be a little bit easier. So I see it. Um, and also, if you would like to super, ch- if you'd like to give us a super chat, you can only do that on Faith Unaltered. Um, so if you're watching on CSG, you want to get your question in, please go ahead and transfer over to the faith unaltered channel. If anybody needs it, let me know. I'll Excuse send me it guys. to you. I got a kid running down here. So no, you're hot. good. You're good. You're good. Um, but go ahead and, uh, and transfer over there. Uh, the reason for that is CSG has not reached a thousand subscribers yet. And everyone knows you have to hit a thousand before you can monetize your channel. That would include super chats. So if you want your question asked, please transfer over to Faith on Alter channel. Like I said, let me know in the comments if you need that link. I'll send it to y'all and uh, and you can send your super chat there. Um, while we are waiting on David, this is going to be interesting. Huh, we're going to, oh, there he is. You didn't have to let me banter. I didn't have to run. Long. No, so, no, you're good. Good buddy. deal. Good deal. I just, had to, I just had to correct some children. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, brother. Again, uh, Luis, uh, thank you for for uh, coming on and discussing this with me. Um, I just wish I was not so congested. I feel like I'm losing my voice here. Um, but I would. My first question would be scripturally: There's no act of veneration that involves prayer. Do you agree with that? <clears throat> Sorry, can you repeat that? Is there any act of veneration scripturally that you can find that involves prayer? Um, there's one that I. Okay, not exactly the same, but it comes fairly close. Daniel chapter 2, uh, verses 46 and 47. Actually, just 46. Uh, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. So King Nebuchadnezzar actually did all those things that, from a Catholic perspective, would be classified as dulia and gave them to D- Daniel. Uh, The main difference, of course, is that Daniel is still alive at this time, but the basic idea is there. Okay, would would you agree that Nebuchadnezzar is actually a pagan that would be doing all that, getting that wrong and stuff like that there? Well, there's nothing (laughs) in the text that says Nebuchadnezzar is wrong because in the very next verse, uh, he gives glory to the one true God, and Daniel accepts the worship there's no indication that he pauses like hold up there nebuchadnezzar you can't do that yeah you, ha- you can only do that to god that, that's interesting that's interesting um when you cited the uh the rabbinic tradition when it came to uh um rachel and um joseph um do you think that that's a good source to quote even though, as I stated, it's from a book that we have no idea uh, where where it comes from. Well, it does show uh, the lines of development in Jewish thought. So uh, it does show that a rabbinic Judaism in general is not averse to this idea, or at best, not all strands of rabbinic Judaism are averse to this idea. Certainly Hasidic Judaism is not, uh, as that Chabad article shows. Yeah. Um, do you agree with Cardinal Newman when he talks about doctrinal development and how these things are OK if they are? And do you think Prayer of the Saints is a doctrinal development? Uh, yes, I'm OK with doctrinal development because that's an empirical reality. All sorts of uh, doctrines that we believe develop, not just distinctly Catholic ones, but those that we all hold in common, such as the Trinity. 
so I'm okay with the idea of the prayer of the saints developing as an idea, as long as uh, by development, we don't think that means, oh, it wasn't there and suddenly it is there. Um, development means that it always existed in some form, but the thought around it and the way it's practiced becomes more fully fleshed out over time. What do you say about our primary source, our prima, right? Uh, I, I don't know if you would use primary source or not, uh, that repeatedly has prayers mentioned to him, and yet not one is praying to a saint. Uh, which primary source? Uh, the Bible, the scriptures, the scriptures, as far as like hmm. what is accepted canonical by both of our traditions. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to get into this topic without turning it into a debate on Sola Scriptura. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Suffice exactly. to say, I don't think that um, I don't think that it, you can derive everything from like uh, explicit uh, instances of how things should be done. That's why the whole good and necessary consequence uh, thing has to take place. Heck, even if I did hold to Sola Scriptura, I think that you can reasonably infer these topics by means of good and necessary consequence. Uh, I know that you, dis as a Baptist, you disagree with, for example, a Presbyterian on infant baptism, but you know the way they derive infant baptism from biblical principles is not that much different. I hear you. I hear you. I'm not, not arguing that. I understand we're not going to get into Sola Scriptura. So I did have another interesting question I thought of on the fly, but now it's like slipping my mind. Um, what does it mean that saints can hear our prayers in heaven? Now, that one is a bit of a mystery. Like we don't know the mechanics of how uh, the saints hear those prayers. Like the way I envision it in my head, and this is completely my own private speculation, is it's like some sort of instantaneous brain transfer what, where the moment we say a prayer, it's instantly in their head like a pop-up notification. Um, but again, we don't know. That's just how I try to envision my head it might have been like. All right. In your tra in the traditions you, you quoted, and I'm, I'm surprised you didn't go with some, some of Swan, uh, Swan's other arguments, though, that you just stuck to that one. But um, it, when, when you're quoting um, – what was I saying? Oh, man, I just lost my train of thoughts. Okay, I'm going to switch up. Okay, my bad. Um, if saints answer our prayers, how do we know that this is the case? Mm -hmm. How would you be able to demonstrate that? It's funny because that's the whole premise behind the canonization process in the Catholic Church. Um, people would ask for the intercession of the deceased, and if there are verified miracles, uh, at least two, uh, that can be attributed to the intercession of a certain saint, uh, then that becomes, um, that leads to their being canonized. And there is a fairly rigorous process that goes into it. That uh, I don't know the mechanics of how it's done, but the Vatican tries to vet all of these uh, miraculous occurrences. And they even have a whole uh, position called the devil's advocate uh, that tries to root out the authentic from the inauthentic. Okay. Okay. Um, if the, <clears throat> if the saints answer our prayers, how do they accomplish the answers? Um, well, we don't believe that they intervene directly. See, this is the difference between what we call direct prayer and intercessory prayer. Uh, direct prayer, which is only given to God is asking God to act, uh, using his own power, uh, to change the conditions on the earth. The saints don't do that. Uh, they merely present prayers uh, to God. So they don't. So if I pray to the Virgin Mary, for example, uh, for me to be able to get a new car because my old one crashed, I'm not asking the Virgin Mary to ask to get me a new car. I'm asking the Virgin Mary to present my request before God to get a new car. Okay, but <coughs> and and I know you hmm. Catholics. You know, you dissent among yourselves on some of these things too. But as I quoted the the prayer of Saint Sebastian, you know, I mean, do you find a problem with that then, in according according to what you just kind of said? Uh, no, I don't. And here's the reason why: because if you intervene on behalf of someone to get something done, um, it is 
uh, in a way, getting that thing done directly. And I actually do have a biblical example of that. Um, in James chapter 5, it says that if you bring someone um, from wandering away from the faith, uh, you have saved that person. Well, we didn't save that person. Christ saved that person. But by bringing that person to the Savior, in a sense, you are saving that person. In the same way, if we ask a saint to intervene on behalf of something and that thing gets done, uh, from a practical perspective, it's the same as if the saint got that thing done. Okay. Um, final question. Uh, if the saints transfer our prayers to God, why is it necessary since God already knows the intents of our hearts and the, the Holy Spirit actually communicates that? For the same reason you would ask any of your friends on earth to pray on your behalf, um, to multiply the number of voices that are presenting that prayer before God. All right. I'm good. I don't know how much time I had left. I didn't want to start. You have stuffing. a minute eight, so minute keep eight. going. All right. Yeah. All right. Just one last question then for fun. Do all or some of the saints in heaven know all earthly language, all all earthly language all at the same time or time so they can hear all the prayers um god gives all of them a starfleet com badge equipped with the universal <laughs> translator that's how it works i do love that i will take that and uh agree with it since i am a huge trekker yes. so i like to think that um the languages up in heaven function on star trek logic <laughs> that would be cool I was about to make a force joke, but that's Star Wars. So yeah, wah, get out of here. Wah, I know, right? <laughs> Star Wars is better. Anyway, all right, guys. Thank you so much for that dialogue between yourselves. We're going to continue the dialogue, and I'm not going to set a timer for this one. We're just going to kind of go until uh, we decide to, to not go anymore and move on to the closing statements and then the audience questions. Again, for our audience, if you would like to start asking questions at this time, please, please do that. Um, again, whether you're watching on Faith Unaltered, whether you're watching on CSG, please put at whichever one you're watching on, Faith Unaltered CSG, and I will see it. Uh, there's questions being asked in the chat right now, but they're directed to the listeners. And so I don't want to I don't want to get a question mixed up uh, that's actually asked for somebody else. So please, please either put, hey, Tyler, I got a question for uh, David or Lewis. And, and, and that's another thing, too, y'all. Please put who your question is for. Um, and that would help me out a lot as well. And so y'all here's, the, I'm going to show you guys something real quick and, and y'all are going to laugh. So I, I, I got two things. I've got one thing for David. I've got one thing for Lewis, because what you guys see all these mark outs right there. I'm writing it down as you guys are starting to address it. And I'm like, well, there goes that one off the list. And so it's cool because we all, I think are on the same page in a way. And I like that. And so I'm going to let you guys go um, a little bit. Uh, David, if you want to continue on the the uh, questioning you were on, go for it, Lewis. If you want to, no. uh, if you thought of a question, um, I, go ahead. I'm going to save my interjections for a little bit later, though. Um, ahead, is it so, so you mentioned earlier um, Gnostic influence as a possible cause um, of why prayers to the yeah. saints may have begun in Christianity. So is it your view that this is a form of Gnosticism? I think definitely Gnosticism did play an early part. I mean, we see a lot of NATO uh, play uh, platonic thought in some of our fathers and so forth. So yeah, I think it's very possible that this could have been something that um, developed as that idea of uh, intermediaries, you know. Um, and the funny thing is where you think that where you think that it should be addressed by the church fathers, it's not, you know, mm -hmm. where you, you, you know, you would see where you think that if they were, if, if, the, if, if this was, if prayers to the saints was a, a common practice when they're actually addressing like Gnostic connections and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they don't say, Oh yeah, I kind of understand you because we have saints that we pray to. No, okay. they don't. They strictly go, no, we pray to God only. And that's kind of something that 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 strikes me as odd, and so I it's it comes from a lot of correlation, uh, or not correlation, but looking at various different church fathers and seeing where, mm -hmm. you know, 
this could be and not only that but seeing the influences knowing what so uh, that is uh -huh. sorry That's so saint clement of alexandria and saint cyprian of carthage were both influenced by gnostics i mean they could have been i'm, I'm not sure that it's totally mm -hmm. um foreign to uh and even some of the influences maybe some of the principles of gnosticism um that were in there and i'm not going to say all of them I, i'm not going to make that claim but there's some ideas that might have had some merit to them you know that they thought philosophically that were okay can, can you ex give me an example of intercession of the saints in a gnostic document um, I don't have any off the top of my head, but I could give you um, notions of the intermediaries yeah. and stuff like that. And may, maybe I could give you that somewhere down the road. I don't Where have. Are you right talking now. about emanations? Because we know emanations were a thing in Gnostic cosmology. Um, no, I'm not talking about that. I, I would have to get okay. the source that I read earlier on that. All right. I didn't really Fair have enough. all of it, all of it written down there. Mm -hmm. So do you actually think that this was a – what gives you the idea, and where do you find this historically, that this was a widespread practice among Judaism when they actually do address it as Dorash uh, yeah. Hamak? Did I say widespread? Um, you did. I, you did. I, would, I, I would go with the – you know what? That may have been a misspeak on my part. I would go with the more modest. It was known among – uh, Second Temple Jews. It's hard to say how widespread any given uh, practice is, given um, uh, the evidence that we have. The most we can say is uh, it existed, and at least some Jews believe this. Yeah, and that, and I, I would I would tend to agree with you there. So, but yeah. if if you want the next topic, uh, yeah. I just want to clear that up. I'm glad you said yeah. it wasn't. You, you didn't make the claim yeah. that because I've heard I've heard a lot of Catholics actually, you know, try to make it you know make it more than what it is but see here's the thing that goes with a lot of things even things that catholics and protestants will agree on for example some of the ways you understand the coming of the messiah uh there were jews who hold to messianic concepts uh that are similar to what early christians believe and we use that as evidence in favor of christianity uh but how widespread actually were some of those messianic com um, concepts. It's hard to say with certainty. Um, I, so the, mo the most we can say is that those ideas were there and they were in the air, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I, do you want to hand it over to Tyler for uh, a question real quick or do you want to go again, Luis? Uh, I can go either way. <laughs> uh, I'd like to hear what Tyler has to say. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm just so since we're in the vein of Gnosticism, my question, and this is to both of you, really, um, not anything, you know, directly to either one of you, but both since because I'm I'm wondering and I think guys, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but Gnosticism as a ideology isn't necessarily a direct offshoot of Christianity, is it like Gnosticism exists? even before Christianity in some aspects. Am, am I right on that, or am I totally wrong? Um, see, there's a lot of theories as to the origins of Gnosticism. So okay. one theory is that uh, it preceded Christianity and then latched onto it when they encountered each other. Another is that hmm. uh, it started off among Christians themselves who were exposed to outside concepts and tried to syncretize the two. Uh, so there's more than one theory as to the origins of Gnosticism. Uh, and I'm not necessarily um, sold on any particular one. Yeah, no, fair I mean, what you see is um, I, I like the whole idea of trying to identify like the proto Gnosticism, you know, okay. which would later develop to the Gnosticism we're all familiar with. Um, you definitely see veins of it, and you could you could like I said, you could see veins of it all throughout uh, the disciples' writing in Scripture. You know, and then how they phrase some things to combat certain ideas that were were oh. out there. Well, and I, the, and I agree with Lewis a, a lot too on that aspect too. So, sure. The reason I ask is because um, it seemed like both of you all were kind of going back at each other, uh, saying that you know, well, maybe uh, Christians were influenced by Gnosticism, and and Gnosticism was influenced by Christianity. How do we tell the difference, really? Which one picked up? 
which one? I mean, how do we know for certain that Gnosticism picked up anything from Christianity? Granted, there's similarities, right? But my question is more so, how do we know which one picked it up from which one, if that makes sense? Like, how, how would you guys be able to? I would that? I wouldn't say that's a relevant question. Um, I would say uh, I would probably more put it like, OK, we have I can a, make a it historical. <laughs> no, no, it, it's, this is not an insult. This is, uh, yeah. I would I would phrase the question differently on that because correlation always doesn't mean causation. Right. So I don't think you can really, really phrase it that way. What we do have in history, we have Christianity. OK, we have the we have Jesus and what he taught. We have the Gospels. You know, we have the, the the accounts, but we also know that this is a melting pot area with a lot of ideas. So mm -hmm. now you can you can what I do is and this is why one of the reasons I'm solo scripture. I mean, there's plenty and, and I'm not going to debate that. But I do think that uh, the teachings of the apostles in, that we have in scripture, that's one way we can identify the outside influences and then understanding the historical context of the area and then you know, looking at different sources that way, we can start seeing um, where it comes about, and then you can start seeing more of the Gnosticism. You know, you can also start seeing that read into um, um, the uh, the I, I want I don't want to call them the wrong thing the Suedo Gospels that we have that are Gnostic that are clearly Gnostic, um, and we know because now we know we do know a lot about Gnosticism as far as its uh, some of its doctrines and stuff and you know, what they thought about like matter and, and reality and stuff like that. I don't know if that answers your question, but mm -hmm. I would probably wouldn't say that, you know, I, I wouldn't phrase it that way. Right on. Uh, Lewis. I think in order to show that prayer to the saints has Gnostic influence, we need to prove two things. One is that the Gnostics had uh, a concept of intercession the saints or something similar enough to it and second that they had that idea before christians began uh believing in the intercession of the saints because uh, if the chronology was the other way around uh then you know that would um weaken the claim of gnostic influence on uh, christian practice mm -hmm. and so far we again we haven't seen any actual examples of gnostics holding to such a concept well, I well we know that there's there are things going on like prayer, praying to angels that Paul talks about in Colossians. I don't know if, mm -hmm. if you have an answer on that, Luis. Uh, and you can give uh, it. I, I just uh, I, I just put it out there. There's, there's see it, this is one of those cases where we have too little information to actually determine what the practice was that Paul was addressing. It's kind of like that whole baptism for the dead thing in First Corinthians. Like, what is he going after? Uh, I don't know of any groups in the first century that worshipped angels, so it's hard to uh, make any sort of hard derivation. Okay. All right. Tyler, is there anything else? Not on that front. I think, uh, you know, given that if there's somehow, and, and just my thoughts on it, I'll, I'll just say, and then we can move on to either different topic. I know I've still got a couple questions uh, as well. But uh, in, in regards to another topic anyway, but it would seem like the historical records would be that evidence, maybe the smoking gun, so to say, of of determining whether or not a specific practice. And David, I'll make it relevant to the debate, namely intercession of the saints uh, in any way, shape or form, whether it's prayers to saints or saintly intercession in general. Um, if we saw that in uh, proto Gnosticism or even uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say same time. So um like same time Gnosticism as Christianity, because again, then you still have the debate. Well, which one came from which? But if we have sources that if Gnosticism is earlier than Christianity and we have sources that are directly alluding to or just directly referencing uh, the practice of intercession of saints, I think that would be the smoking gun. Um, I don't know. Lewis, you I think you did touch on this uh given that we're on historical data mm -hmm. it was did i misunderstand you did you say that the third century was the earliest uh we have of christians uh that we know mm -hmm. that christians pr had this practice uh, of could, praying to saints we could possibly infer it from the martyrdom of polycarp which if we did okay. that would push it back to the mid second century but the mm -hmm. martyrdom of polycarp is uh, a little ambiguous on that front it does show that 
um, the early Christians honored the saints and collected their relics. Uh, so does it possibly follow from that that they also asked for uh, the martyrs' intercession? Maybe. But uh, as far as explicit examples go, we have to wait another half century. Right. What I, we I don't think... find is uh, this practice being condemned. Like, uh, as soon as this practice begins appearing in Christian circles, it is treated as something uncontroversial. Mm -hmm. David, any follow-up? Um, I, I think he's actually uh, okay. So I would say that Lewis was, is wrong on that. I think there is examples where uh, it goes too far, um, and you know I do see that in Epiphanius, but I do also uh, um, think that it it is it, it is in the third century that you really see it developing. I think Lewis is right about it uh, being. You know, I don't really think you could take it from Polycarp there. I, I won't see how it could be inferred at all, but um, um, the 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 best thing that they have was if that the um, that early prayer to Mary was actually from 250 or earlier. But uh, the recent scholarship, um, and I have the, the name here, um, uh, Theodore de Burnt on prayers to the intercession of Mary in Greek and what Litur blah, can't say it right now. Sorry, guys. Speaking to the Litur mic, brother. <laughs> liturgical and paraliturgical text from Egypt by Theodore de Brunt, who says that the modern papyri is actually, the modern scholarship on that papyri is that it's actually, could be very possibly as late as the 7th century. 7th century? Yeah. yeah. I need to double check that uh, papyrus because it doesn't look like a 7th century papyrus. I don't think so either. Uh, right. They also they also, uh, they also also say it could be still 4th century, but the, what what my point is is that they're, they're, they're pushing it back. They're not mm -hmm. making it early. Anyway. Like, I am looking at a picture of the earliest manuscript right now of Subtuum Presidium, and it Can looks you share a that? lot like a third century papyrus. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia article on okay. Subtuum Presidium, they actually have an okay. image of that manuscript. Yeah. Um, and if you compare it with, say, a New Testament unseal from the same century, the handwriting uh, looked very similar. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, I, I mean, I defer to the scholarship on that one as well. Um, we know that, you, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be able to make that judgment myself. So, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't be able to say that it does. But just because it looks like it doesn't mean it is. And the fact that these mm -hmm. guys are actually um, saying it's not now, it, it's, it's highly contested. So, yeah. Okay. Right on. Um, I do want to, uh, well, uh, Lewis, do you have anything else on, on this vein? If not, I would like to ask a clarifying question uh, to David. Ask sure. Okay. All right. Um, so so switching topics at this point, and, and David, I'm not going to push back on you on this one. It was just, I thought I heard you say it, and I just want to make sure that I did hear you say this. Um, but you said in your opening statement that it, or I think you did, uh, that if Jesus changes something from the Old Testament, that means Moses was wrong about it when he wrote it down. Is that accurate? No. No. What What did you mean? Um, in that particular statement, I was saying when it was per, per specifically regarding the necromancy clause, right, where that prohibition mm -hmm. came came from. Right. What my whole point was that if it was just because Jesus came and gave us the image of God and it's okay now to use icons and this and that, then Moses is actually wrong for writing it in the first place because Jesus and God did appear visibly before Sinai, especially to Abraham. If you think back. All right. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of issues there, uh, um, that can, that, that could come from that. But my whole point was, um, was that, you know, Jesus did appear before Sinai. An image of God was present before and existing in the world. And that, and still we get the prohibition there. Stop laughing at me, Luis. It's not funny. I'm sorry I can't sorry. talk. <laughs> sorry. I'm just laughing because someone in the group chat misspelled polycarp as polycarbonate. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good, good stuff. Okay. Um, 
Lewis, is there any follow-up uh, that you would uh, have? I, I, I just got one more clarifying question on that. I will, remark. Say, I will say this. Um, mm -hmm. Like, Moses may not have been wrong, but some of the ways he was interpreted could have been wrong. Mm -hmm. And we know that at least some of the rabbinic interpretations were wrong because Jesus corrects them in the Sermon on the Mount. So is it possible that um, the interpretation that at, that the uh, holy men who have gone up uh, to be with God and asking for their intercession was one of those wrong interpretations that needed to be corrected? Well, that's possible, but we have no example from Jesus uh, either endorsing or condemning the practice. So we can't really say either way. Uh, just going off of um, the red letters of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. David? I don't have anything for that. So then in that same vein, my, my second question. I already answered on... anyway. Sorry. I was well, I didn't know if you had a follow-up. So No, no. So to response. I mean, this is informal dialogue, right? We can yeah, go back and absolutely. forth a little bit. Oh, absolutely. So, all right. Um, so given that Moses does give the commandment in in second or, or the uh, first or second commandment, depending if you're Protestant or Roman Catholic, um, are we're we're not to believe that that applies to all images, right? I mean, the Jews themselves use image in their liturgy. Um, I don't know. What, somebody's going to make a clip of me saying that that liturgy the way I did. I don't know why I stumbled through that, but anyway, um, but that's not a reference to all images, is it? We know that the Jews had uh, cherubim you know, in embroidered on their uh, on the tent of the tabernacle. We know that they used images on the Ark of the Covenant, even, and and so that's not a command against images per se right what are, what are you talking about here the second commandment the commandment not to uh not to make uh graven images that's what i'm not asking to worship any graven images yeah well, right, so like them, so yeah. so when we yeah so when we look at the temple you have to realize that the temple is supposed to reflect the throne room right mm -hmm. so you would expect god to say yeah you can put cherubim here and this and that it's when we get into worshiping uh, uh, and objects of worship. You got to remember, like they thought the calf was a rep, uh, a represent, a representation of the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. They thought that's what it was. Mm -hmm. So you also look in Judges, where uh, a, a guy comes down and melts down the silver to make a representation of the God of Israel, and it doesn't go well for him. So you know, so yeah, I, that would be my answer. So I no, I, I don't think images are a bad thing. Um, so okay. And and just to clarify again, yeah. and, and you just do yes or no, you ain't gotta go through all that again. But the but yeah. the second commandment is not a prohibition against all images to be used in liturgical worship, right? I would say in, in worship, yeah, I don't think they should be used in worship. I don't know what you mean by by that. So no, I don't think they should be used in worship. Uh, if they're in the if they're in okay. the building, I so I would say fine. I decorate so, the way you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're sitting down, bowing down and kissing them, I think you got a problem. I think you are crossing the line. What about sprinkling blood on them? What do you mean? So in its law, its mosaic law, that right. once a year the ar or the ark, the priest, the high priest comes into the holy of holies and sprinkles blood pretty much all over the place. But one of the specific commandments is to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, which is. If he, if he did that, he would be sprinkling blood. What I'm trying to get at is he's actively participating with these images, these statues in this case. Um, and I would say that that would be a form of worship. This is what God commanded the high priest to do, interact with these images during a uh, liturgical setting. And so that's my question. That's not, that's not forbidden, right? No, because I, I think it'd be a little bit different than how you're you're describing it where like when he's going down and, and throwing the blood. Okay, go ahead, Luis. Good. Well, finish your thought, uh, David. I don't know. No, I, I want, he's good. He, he wants to jump in. So I'll let him. Okay. Well, I, I just had a couple of clarification questions of my own. Uh, and don't worry, David, I'm going to jump on Lewis here in a minute. So this ain't, this okay, ain't me. Us you talked up on about, you. We talked about worshiping images in your view. What constitutes worship? Oh uh, well, th that's a good question. I think uh, prayer is is worship, and that's what I uh -huh. outlined in my in my uh, in my statement. Um, so I mean, I would that's that's where I would go. Prayer is a form of worship. Um, adoration, 
Um, I, I mean, I have I have lists, uh, a list of, of things that could be, okay. but um, yeah, I would consider things like adoration and and serving. Um, I already told you my, my position on the La Triadulia distinction. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've covered it, I think. Okay. Uh, does bowing down and offering incense count as worship? Um, in a religious context, probably. Okay. Um, it, is what Nebuchadnezzar doing to Daniel in Daniel 2.46 a form of worship? The, like I said, I haven't read that text, so I don't okay. know the answer of what's going on particularly mm -hmm. in that text myself um yeah. if it was a surface i'd say well ne nebuchadnezzar's wrong and daniel would be mm -hmm. wrong to accept worship um if that's, that's the right. case that's going on but like i'm not familiar with that text enough to be able to give you a solid <coughs> um defense on that I, and it's a good question it, it's a good question and like yeah. i said i mean i as far mm -hmm. as I, I don't know about that one that much yeah. so yeah, the reason why I ask is, you know, the Latria Dulia distinction uh, isn't just something that Catholics came up with out of thin air. Uh, it is actually necessary to understand some parts of scripture. So from a Catholic perspective, uh, what Nebuchadnezzar is doing in Daniel 2.46 is a form of Dulia. Uh, and because of that, Daniel can accept what Nebuchadnezzar is doing without condemning it because from Daniel's perspective, Nebuchadnezzar isn't uh, worshiping Daniel. He's merely venerating him. No, no. I mean, like I said, I don't yeah. know enough about the verse to be able to comment directly. Mm -hmm. But if he's in any form of, uh, I don't know, the Greek word of prostrated, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. It, the word is that. The proskuneo, I would say that. That is specifically a form that is given yeah. to God. But I don't know enough about the verse to be able to comment. So you know more about yeah. that one than I do. So I'll let it I'll let it lie there. Here, here's the thing, because I do some lexical semantics there. First of all, if you read the Septuagint on that verse, proskuneo is used. But it's also used in a number of contexts that are clearly not worship. So um, for example, we have multiple examples in both the Septuagint and the Greek New Testament of uh, people bowing down before a king, and yeah. uh, it's proskuneo is used in that context. So yeah. uh, that is a form of veneration, uh, but the fact and, that the word proskuneo is used doesn't automatically make something worship. Yes, and and again, I would agree with that. So uh, when we're talking about uh, religious worship and in a religious context, that's where I would be able to. Um, um, speak to so i mean that that's where we'd probably um have like i said there's plenty of examples and i i even said this in my opening um that the semantic range is what we're talking about you know so right. like we're also talking about uh um we're not, in other words, we're not talking about something that's outside of that semantic range. So we would expect to see them using those words for that particular uh instance that's not in regards to worship and stuff like that so anyways right. i agree i mean i think we're we're on the same page there all right that's fair um i don't have any more follow-up <laughs> i don't either um tyler are we getting uh, about question and answer now yeah we can i'm gonna i'm just gonna pause real quick and okay. i've got to take another uh probably about five seconds to do something real quick that's fine all right, because my kids came back down here and they're flipping out. Well, so uh, I've got a question for Lewis anyway. Yeah. So okay, go ahead. So go okay. All right, Lewis. Um, so whenever it comes to Second Maccabees, right? What is a good way? And and uh, I'm I'm trying to be as unbiased as I possibly can. Uh, whenever it comes to this, because we agree on this subject, you know what I mean. And so it, it's kind of hard for me to come up with uh, with uh, pushback to you. Um, whenever it comes to this topic in particular and so my my question though i think it's more practical than it is really anything whenever it comes to second maccabees and i know this isn't a solo script toward debate but what's what's a good way that we can have common ground with our protestant brothers and sisters that deny the scriptural authority and sometimes even the the authority as a whole whenever it comes to second maccabees what route do you usually take 
to say, look, there is some common ground here, guys, um, and this is what it is. Like, how would you address that uh, as a Roman Catholic? Okay, so here's one thing that I've noticed. Um, a lot of Protestant commentators uh, have no problem citing historical sources that they don't regard as canonical in order to shed light on the Bible. For example, Josephus gets mentioned a lot. Uh, but I don't know any Christian who regards the antiquities of the Jews as uh, inspired scripture. We mm. merely see it as a reliable historical document. Mm -hmm. uh, even when, uh, when it comes to First and Second Maccabees, I know a lot of Protestant scholars who will cite First and Second Maccabees as useful historical sources for the Maccabean period. Uh, it's only when the you know it's only when um, a practice is mentioned in first and second Maccabees that goes against a specifically Protestant idea uh, mm -hmm. that suddenly oh we can't touch that it is apocrypha mm -hmm. so this is one of those examples uh, as you can tell so historical data like this is we use all kinds of texts not only you know authoritative text in the sense though we would agree that second Maccabees is authoritative uh, in that sense but looking at it more from the standpoint of this is historical data that we should take into account to yeah. be fair to the times of of uh, that context of that yeah. that genre and in, in, in historical period. Yeah. Okay, all right, I like that. So what we can this is what we can know from mm -hmm. Second Maccabees. We can know from Second Maccabees that certain Jews living in the second century who were highly patriotic and believed firmly in the supremacy of Judaism over Hellenism believe that um intercession of the saints was a thing mm. so these are unlikely candidates for hellenization uh when it comes to that particular practice yeah yeah right i um, i do have one more thing so i'm looking at a, a website so carm i'm sure we're all familiar with that matt slick's website and he uh puts in his article of, on intercessions of the saints and you guys talked about this a little bit uh whenever it comes to prayer uh but i just want to read this real quick and then we'll move on to closing statements and uh in audience q a but he says biblical biblically prayer uh is always offered to god and is a form of worship all religions view prayer as an act of worship to their gods since they contain petitions confessions of sin requests of intercessions etc things that uh, things which are received and answered by God and not by created things. And so I guess my question is, I've heard this not only in Orthodox circles, but in uh, Roman Catholic circles as well and Protestant circles as well. Um, so all around the board. But would it could we possibly make more headway with our brothers and sisters who disagree with us on this subject? if we would simply use terminology like ask intercessions for or instead of instead of the pray to because as a protestant this was one of my and even uh converting to orthodoxy this was one of the big hang-ups that i had and and i'm, I'm good with it because i understand what it what what we what we mean whenever we say that now right but for somebody that's not um in this mindset that that would would hear pray to enter enter the name of that person here as that act of um not not duly and hyperdulia um but the other one I, I don't know why it's escaping my head um but but would we would could we make headway with our our friends and family and brothers and sisters uh if we would yeah. just simply use language like that um see that is actually an approach that a number of catholic apologists are taking saying that okay. oh you know we don't pray to the saints we ask the saints to pray for us uh like i can see why a lot of Watch. people want to go that route mm -hmm. uh the issue there is it doesn't really do justice to the um historical linguistics at play here because uh prayer historically had a much wider semantic field um, um, David said that, oh, prayer always means worship. Well, um, that wasn't 
always the case. That wasn't always how it was understood. Uh, prayer comes from the Latin precari, which means to beg. So pray literally means really to just beg for something or to request something. Mm. Uh, think about Shakespearean English, where someone, instead of saying, I ask of you, would say, I pray Pray tell, you. yeah. Yes, exactly. So the word pray um, was used very broadly in older English, even to refer to asking a still living person for something. It's only in the past couple hundred years that the uh, meaning of the word prayer has narrowed so that we only ever use it to refer to uh, some form of religious communication. So given though that language evolves over time, right? Would we do, I mean, and not necessarily saying that like cut it out completely, but if somebody has a problem with that language, right? That, that well, I pray to the saints, if they don't buy what you just said, then could we net, could could we and and still be honest and truthful about it say well again we're not you know it, there, there's a difference and i think this is where the latria thank you uh G, G, i appreciate it uh i don't know why that escaped me but um i guess that's what i'm i guess that's what i'm trying to ask mm -hmm. is that you know meet people where they are i think that's a good philosophy that we we try to you know predicate on the show and, and, and really practice in real life, man. Uh, I'm a big fan of cultural apologetics. You know what I mean? And so meeting people where they are, I think, is a, is a good step forward in, in any conversation, especially when it comes about Christ. Uh, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on, on that? I think your mileage may vary on that one. It does okay. work when talking to some Protestants, but not all of them. Yeah. Um, I think a more hard-headed anti-Catholic or anti-Orthodox Protestant person uh, would accuse you of obfuscation at that point. Mm. But I think for someone who isn't um, that uh, hard, uh, you know, set on their ways, uh, yeah. it could work. Right. You know, it's funny, Luis, is I, I had a whole section on that that I was going to add in my opening, but that's one of the things I cut out and I just mentioned it. <laughs> and Tyler, I think you even noticed that I mentioned it earlier um, mm -hmm. in my opening. Um, unfortunately where i would disagree here is yeah. on the, this whole idea of prayer okay when when i say prayer when i'm talking about prayer i am meaning it in the biblical sense so when i'm looking at that in the bible that's what i'm talking about so like if, if and if you're if you're uh asking of intercession looks anything like how i pray or how uh prayer is described in the bible and you're doing that to saints, that's where the Protestant would have the problem. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, that's just where we'd have the problem. And that's not, you, you know, I'm not debating if it's right or wrong at this point, but I'm just sure. saying that's where the, where they would uh, have us, you know, that's where they're being axed to grind, I think. Right. No, and and I, I think you're right, David. Um, I, I think that if there was an axe to grind, that would be, you know, where it is. I don't know how Lewis would, would handle that. Uh, me personally, uh, would just say, look, and, and uh, you know, we've talked about this before off of air and just communication is communication, right? There's no difference in my head. And I think, you know, given that people, uh, the ones that engage in that in this activity are the best sources to go to to explain, hey, what it is that I'm doing. I can't speak for the Orthodox Church. I can't speak for uh, the Roman Catholic Church and I can't speak for uh, any other church, period. Uh, but I can speak for myself. And if I say to someone, hey, look, you know, um, I'm talking to you right now. Do you consider that prayer? Well, no. OK, fair enough. Uh, communication, we can communicate through text messages. We can communicate um, with, with the advancement of technology, with our microphones and our cameras and just all different kinds of sorts of ways. And that's my thing. Like I'm communicating no different to those saints uh, mm -hmm. that are alive and in heaven. Uh, than I am with you guys right now. And so, and I don't consider that an act of worship uh, mm -hmm. in, in that sense anyway. But Lewis, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, there are a number of um, reasons why um, a Protestant might consider that different. Maybe it's the content of some of those prayers or maybe mm. it's the way they're formulated. Um, see, see, I can talk, speak to both of those things. Uh, mm -hmm. The way it's formulated, uh, as you know, both in the Catholic and Orthodox traditions, mm -hmm. Uh, our prayers to the saints tend to be highly formulaic. Um, right. But if you think about it, a lot of uh, other forms of communication that we have with still living persons are also highly formulaic. So, um, for example, a politician giving a speech in parliament or Congress mm -hmm. for you 
uh, Yanks out there, uh, is also highly formulaic. Uh, that doesn't <laughs> mean that the politician is praying or worshiping uh, his fellow members of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, as for the content, um, from a Catholic perspective, we do have actual clearly demarcated ideas of where the line between veneration and worship is drawn. So for example, uh, we would never uh, offer sacrifice to Mary or one of the saints. We would never ask them um, to forgive our sins because forgiving sins is a prerogative of God alone. Mm -hmm. uh, if a Catholic or an Orthodox person ever prayed um, to Mary or the saints in such a way as to assume uh, that they could do such things, then they would have crossed the line. Mm -hmm. But if you look carefully at um, all of the standard prayers addressed to Mary and the Saints, that line is never crossed. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest problem with Protestants, uh, they don't believe that uh, every Catholic believes they are intentionally worshiping saints or anything. Our concern, I think, is, and I think Luis said this well, is that we think the type of veneration given can fall into that definition of worship. So <clears throat> there is that. And I would also, uh, man, I, I had another point, but like, I think, it, it, I mean, it was an earlier point. So I'm just going to leave it there. No, I think you're right. And also just to side with you, David, you know, given the context in which, you know, both Orthodox and Catholics, like, you know, just like what Lewis said in, in the formulaic way that that we do those things, I definitely see and understand how it can be. Um, I, and I don't want to see confused because to to a Protestant, it's not, you know, confused. Um, but but I definitely see how, you know, like I said earlier about, you know, having the axe to grind, that's would be where it would be is in that religious context. Um, so so I agree with you 100 percent on what you just said, David. Um, uh, and the and the thing is, you know, like. I really think that, you know, that portrayal, I mean, it, it really does put that religious context there. And I think that it crosses over, it can bleed over very easily into that. And I think that if yeah. you're going to be an Eastern Orthodox or a Catholic, you need to be very careful on the foot you tread. I mean, human beings have a natural knack to get into idolatry. You know, <laughs> it's just this thing we just gravitate towards from someone. I mean, Israel fell through you know into it time and time yeah. again and that's the protestants protest is that hey look y'all are taking this way too far and mm -hmm. i think it, it was even in epiphanius's time when he talks about it a little bit mm -hmm. um he's saying that sometimes they're they're, they're going too they're, they're going too far in what they're doing because um mm -hmm. some weird stuff was happening you know um with it so um yeah so i mean there's 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 precedent for that to happen so mm -hmm. it, you have to be careful uh, i i mean it, i agree that it's possible to take things too far but the question is who's to say at what point things are taken too far because even protestants don't agree on that point um, I'll give you two examples, uh, the use of images of Jesus. Um, certain Protestant traditions, such as Anglicans and Lutherans, say having those images are okay. They don't necessarily venerate them, but they use them as devotional aids, whereas the Reformed tradition historically eschewed all images of Jesus. Uh, or think about uh, the whole debate on regulative versus normative principle of worship. Uh, a lot of Reformed people historically said that uh, worship had to be done a certain way, and if it violated that uh, way of doing things, then you are doing unlawful worship, which you know also becomes a form of idolatry. Whereas, well, and again, then we have, <laughs> well, then, and that's uh, no, I was just gonna play with you real quick and jump in and, and joke, but um, and then then we had Munster, right? And then we had to come together and say, okay, you guys are taking it too far. <laughs> yeah. Munster was, was a, a stain on uh, church history <laughs> that never should have happened. <laughs> For those yeah. that don't know about Munster, go yeah. look up it, the Munster rebuild. You know, the thing is, just because Protestants don't agree, don't, doesn't mean that yeah. you, you know it, the, a practice is as good as bad. Just because Catholics disagree within themselves on how this stuff is, doesn't mean uh, it, it's good or bad. And the EO disagree with the Catholics on how far they should take it. And, and all that too so i mean there yeah. is that tension so um is it a good practice and like i said in my opinion no all yeah. right well 
again, I can only speak to the Catholic tradition, but uh, if we assume, you know, which I do, that um, we interpret scripture in light of sacred tradition in the church, then the church tells us where is the point where things go too far. So the church uh, provides that line of demarcation for us. And and then uh, I would just add the same, I'm pretty sure the same with the Orthodox Church as well. Um, so there is that line there. Uh, but I definitely do agree with that David. Teaching. Huh? You just taught some people. I was just joking with you. Oh. oh. I'm getting um, my sense of humor back as I'm starting to feel the effects of some of this medicine I just took. Well, hey, there you go. There you go. But, David, what I was going to say, if you just w if shut up for just two seconds, no, I'm just playing, um, is that I agree with you. I think that there is, you know, a precedent to to be cautious. I mean, even as a Christian, because of what you said, I mean, we in one sense – in one sense, we are right because we all, uh, those who trust Christ, we we have our the Holy Spirit indwelling us, right? And so, in that sense, um, I don't want to say better, but we are more informed. We are more connected, I guess, to God than Old Testament Israel was. And yet, we see all the time, even in a New Testament context, people going stray. I mean, there there's the warning passages that that we all agree with. Uh, that are in Hebrews uh, that are scattered throughout the New Testament. Don't be led astray. Don't be led astray. Uh, I just translated First John first time, uh, and I just published it on. Uh, well, it's it's a published draft anyway, uh, on Academia, of my uh, my Greek translation of the uh, SBLGNT, uh, so the Society of Biblical mm -hmm. Literatures Greek New Testament, and uh, I did an English translation of First John. And the very last sentence in that in in that letter in that epistle is little children guard yourself from idols right and and so easy to fall into uh, that category but lewis i know that you said uh, that you just sent me a private message about 4 30. uh so guys let's move into the closing yeah. statements go it ahead. is yeah go ahead oh i just wanted to add a little quick note because that saint epiphanius was mentioned a couple of times yeah uh, i know that uh, there's an article floating around on the internet somewhere uh going into that particular anecdote Without going to the details, it seems that the authenticity of that particular um, anecdote is in question. So not everyone thinks that that actually happened. I just want to throw oh. that out there. Well, with that, I, I don't want to move on. I want to give David a chance to respond to that, um, and then yeah. we'll move on. I'll give David, I'll give you the last word. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add to Lewis's revelation? Yeah. No, I'm good, bud. I'm good. You're good? I'm yeah. like, <coughs> okay. No, you're good. I just want to give you the last word on that. So, All right. All right. Let's move into closing statements. Uh, we have Lewis. You are up first. And I'm just going to set the timer for five minutes because we agreed two to five minute closing statements. So I'll set the timer for five minutes. And if you get done before that, please let me know. Also, uh, with our audience, um, if you guys and gals would, there is still time to get your questions in for these guys, the way it looks, um, depending on how the, the closing statements go, I think we're going to get to all of them at this point. And so, uh, again, I just want to reiterate, if you would like to donate uh, and help Faith Unaltered and CSG out, please send us a super chat. You can, uh, we've got PayPal, or no, I'm sorry, not PayPal, Cash App and Venmo. And both of those, just type in Faith Unaltered. I'll put a link, if it's not already there, in the description of this video. Uh, you can click that. We accept PayPal. Or, man, I don't know why I keep saying PayPal. Venmo, Cash App. And then if you want to uh, send David or me uh, uh, financial contributions over Facebook Messenger, if you would prefer to uh, do that. Um, if not, if none of those uh, wet your whistle, then email me at faithunaltered at gmail.com. I will put you, uh, I'll give you a way uh, to send us some money. Also, ways to uh, to support our channel please pray for us. I think prayer is the best way to support this channel. We're not going to do anything God doesn't allow us to do. And so please pray that this channel would expand. Um, also, uh, like, like, like the videos, like our content that helps us with the YouTube algorithms. Um, subscribe to our channel if you have not subscribed. And we are listener uh, dependent. And what I mean by that is we rely on our audience to spread the word about both Faith Unaltered and the Complete Center's Guide. And so please share this on social media uh, as much as you can. Make clips of the videos, post them on TikTok. I don't care. I give you all permission to do that. Um, so with that being said, Lewis, you are up. Let me set the timer. 
and we give me just a sec five minutes all right i'll start the timer whenever you start speaking sir okay so uh in my opening presentation i talked about three lines of evidence that to me show that intercession of the saints rests on firmly historical and biblical grounds. Uh, you have the Jewish roots of the practice, uh, you have the New Testament principles undergirding the practice, and then you have uh, the early Christians actually demonstrating that practice in their theology and their worship. And these three things put together create a cumulative case for the Christian belief in the intercession of the saints. Uh, now, my opponent uh, today tried to uh, undermine each of these three points, but uh, in my opinion, he has not done so satisfactorily. Um, he suggested that perhaps the reason why the early Jews and early Christians engaged in this practice was because of extraneous um, influence, either it be from the Gnostics or from Hellenistic Greeks, but we have no evidence that either the Greeks or the Gnostics had any such equivalent practice or that the ancient Jews and Christians derived such a practice from them. Uh, also, uh, we have seen that my opponent uh, does not have a very firm hermeneutic when it comes to uh, how to establish principles uh, for prayer from the scriptures. He stated that we should find, uh, ex use examples of prayer from the Bible, uh, but uh, neglects the idea of good and necessary inference because uh, there are many ways that we pray that even a Protestant would accept as legitimate but have no explicit scriptural um, uh, precedent, such as, for example, addressing prayers to the third person of the Trinity. Uh, finally, uh, we have seen that um, although my opponent has tried to make a link between intercession of the saints and the biblical condemnation of uh, necromancy and mediums, uh, these are two very different practices. We cannot simply assume that any form of communication between someone on earth and someone on heaven uh, automatically fits the bill as necromancy because there is a very... Um, fixed definition of what that means, uh, and the Protestant uh, argument that the Catholic slash Orthodox belief uh, practice is a form of necromancy needs to be put to rest. So with that, I will say that the case that I made remains firmly in place and has not been refuted. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for that, Lewis. And just to confirm with you, you're conceding the rest of your time. All right, David, let me. All right. Whenever you start speaking, sir, I will start the timer. I just wanted everybody to be aware that today's debate was not about me proving a case against. I'm not going to argue the negative. The burden of proof tonight was on Luis to firmly establish that this is a practice we should be engaging in. And he brought up historicity in my opening statement. I disproved that his his whole example of Rachel praying to uh, um, Joseph. We have no idea if that even happened. We have no idea historically if that ever happened. We addressed so many different things, and I showed how flimsy of a source it was. And Lewis Ginsburg didn't even um, quote Midrashim. So I, I showed that. I brought evidence to demonstrate that. All I have to do, guys, is play the skeptic. Okay. Luis admitted as much that the there's so many diverse beliefs in Second Temple Judaism. We can't say that this is an actual practice that goes all the way back to that to the to them. Oh, just some Jews practiced it. Okay, well, whenever you present these these cases, especially if you were to look at like Josephus or Philo, they all are about saints praying for people in heaven, which the Protestant doesn't have a problem with. It doesn't necessitate, however, that we are to pray to them or invoke them in any way. Matter of fact, Tyler's brought this up that he prays to people that are alive in Christ, but fails to mention that they're also called the dead in Christ. Okay, there is a distinction 
of those that have passed on from this world to the next. There is a status change. I'm not going to pray for my brother to get healed from cancer because he's already in heaven. He's already there. He's already glorified. There is no cancer in heaven. He has a more direct source to God. Yes, he's talking about God. I hope he would uh, say, hey, look, my friend Dave's down there working his, his butt off trying to, you know, uh, uh, spread the gospel. And, you know, God already knows that. God would probably be like, yeah, he's awesome. I, I would hope he'd say that. <laughs> but in all honesty, guys, I, I don't think he proved his point tonight. Um, he, he mentioned that I don't have anything implicit. I don't believe it in implicit things. Of course I believe implicit things. I just didn't go the route he wanted me to go. And I don't think he established firmly tonight that prayer to the saints should be practiced. Thank you. All right. Just to double check, David, you're conceding the rest of your time. Yep. Okay. All right, y'all. That wraps up the formal part of the debate. All right. I'm going home. Bye. And I uh, <laughs> uh, let me get this on here. Okay, and uh, and we'll move on to the audience uh, questions. I did not get any more audience questions, so unless you want to send us a super chat, uh, we are closing the audience questions right now. So, with that being said, our, our first question, and we'll do the super chats first. There was two of them uh, from the same person, and again, I am sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Jib. Um, Please correct me off off that. My wife just brought me some watermelon, so I'll eat that here in just a second. But the first super chat from Gib, $5. Thank you so much. Uh, for David, if intercession of angels or saints was foreign in the Old Testament, what does Job 5.1 and Job 33.23 mean? You know, I would love like a specific question um, instead of us like pulling out scripture verses. Talking to the mic, brother. Yeah, I don't know because I haven't read that verse right now. So I would have to like okay. go back and look what the context is and see what that's about. Um, I don't have a ready answer. Sorry about that. But uh, of course, there's a lot you have to leave on the threshing floor when you debate a topic this broad. Um, I don't know what that particular passage says. I'm kind of like looking for it. So, um, but I would have to do a, a complete workup on it. So, um, that's my answer. I mean, okay. I mean, since it's a super chat, like, can we look at maybe one of them up and and just give your best off the top? Or Lewis, do you? Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna I read. Pull it up on the on verbum so you can see the text. Yeah, yeah. Five one or thirty three twenty three. Um, Lewis, if you yeah. want to pull that up. Okay, yeah. so uh, I'm in. Oh no, wait, I'm in another one. Uh, Lewis, if you want to go first, David, I'll give you a chance to read it and uh, and, and formulate yeah. what you're going to say. So Job 5 verse 1 says, Call now, is there anyone who will answer you? To which of the holy ones will you turn? Job 33, 23 says, If there be for him an angel, a mediator, one of the thousand, to declare to man what is right for him. Um, I will say this. Uh, it didn't occur to me to use these as proof text for my case. Uh, could they be uh, positive arguments? Maybe. But uh, again, just like David, I haven't uh, looked into them deeply enough to make that call. At best, I would say it's a maybe. Yeah. And, and again, of course, I would have to look at, you know, who are the holy ones he's talking about? Is he talking about angels and stuff like that? I uh, I don't know the context. Uh, obviously, again, I, I'm totally with Luis on this one. We'd have to look it up. And if there's anything there, discuss yeah. it, you know. So, yeah. Sorry, Tyler. One thing I, I was a super chat. One thing I could do is try to find other instances of the word in question to see if that sheds light. Um, I don't think the word's too much in question. I, I mean, I think we, we would have to do, I, I don't want to like piecemeal it. You know what I mean? I think that, that's yeah. kind of an abuse to, to do that on the fly. Yeah, I do know this because uh, right now in the Hebrew text of Job 5.1 it says mikdoshim. Um, sim, the cognate, that word kadash, kadosh, is used to refer to saints or holy ones. In Psalms, for example, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his holy ones. So it can refer to um, deceased saints. And it is used that way elsewhere in scripture 
That's why I said it's a so, maybe for me. So real quick, guys, um, Giob actually messaged back and said in the Septuagint, it's Angelos. In the Hebrew, it is Malak. Um, so just want to throw that in there. Yeah, and, and there's could be several answers for this, you, you know, and that's why I would like to, to treat it with uh, more care is if I go into it. Because, like, right off the top of my head, I'm thinking, okay, this could mean saints that are alive. How do we know they're saints that are dead, you know? Like, you know, um, so, I mean, are they messengers, you know? Are they just messengers? Are they people that are alive now? Who are you going to call, you know? Um, so, I mean, there's just a lot of questions that, that are in my mind right now that I would like to uh, address. I mean, it's a great question, though. Thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, Lewis, if you want to go ahead and bring up Psalm 103, 20. Um, the next super chat is from Jeeb, uh, and this mm. time it is a $10 super chat. Thank you, Jeeb, for that. Um, and then the question is uh, for David as well. Uh, in Psalm 103, 20 and the 21st, um, David is exhorting angels and the heavenly host to worship God. Is there a difference between exhortation and prayer? If so, what is it? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, what we what we got here is David exhorting angels, and I, I think that um, we 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 kind of do this in everyday life. You know, um, when we are like you, you know happy about something and this and that. I don't see this as as um, another uh, uh, like I see it as an apple and oranges kind of thing. I don't think this is really um, um, justifying saying, look. You can you can tell these angels to go pray to God. I think this is more of that that instance where David is just like, yes, everything. Because if you read the context and you keep reading um, Psalms one hundred three, I, I think this is the the one I'm thinking of. Um, is that he continues to do exhortion, saying praise him, do this, do that. He's and he goes through a whole list of things that should be worshiping God. And I don't think that's like a I don't think that necessitates that. You know, we can assume that this is a proof text to pray to saints. Mm -hmm. Lewis, you got any follow up? I will say this. There is a one way in which they are meaningfully similar to each other. And that is they are both imperatives addressed to someone who is in heaven. So, you know, in intercession, you're asking, you know, you are, you know, asking someone in heaven to pray to God on your behalf. Whereas in this instance, you have um, the psalmist asking the angels in heaven um, to bless the Lord. Maybe ask is a little too weak, you know. Um, like, I don't want to say command either because that's also too strong. But yeah, exhortation seems like the best word here. But you can just as well say we are exhorting the saints to pray for us. Uh, so it seems like the difference is more difference of degree rather than of kind. So, Lewis, I think you'll appreciate this being a, a, a reader of Greek. Um, what, so you know as well as I do that in, in the Greek language, and this might even apply to Hebrew too, let me know if it does, but if we see someone that is using, of lower status, is, is using an imperative in regards to someone of higher status, right? It's more of an entreaty versus a command, right? Is that is that fair to say? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes that does occur in Hebrew, but I wouldn't lean too heavily on okay. the on that particular aspect of the grammar. Hmm. Right on. All righty. I appreciate that. Okay. That is all of our super chat. So I will just go in order. Um, again, some of these questions are not addressed to anybody in particular. So I'll let both of you answer. Uh, since the last right. two were directed at David, we'll start with Lewis on this one. Um, would Moses and Elijah appearing in the New Testament be an example of intercession? Now, I want to be careful in how I word this. If you... Go back carefully to the uh, cross-examination where I mentioned the transfiguration. I didn't say that Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus was a form of intercession. Mm -hmm. What I was using that as an example of is someone uh, in the someone up in heaven communicating with someone here on earth. Now, intercession would be if that communication involved a 
request. So I wouldn't quite use the word intercession um, in that sense. David? I just think it's so funny that we have to reach this far to try to uh, justify this, you know, like this doctrine here. But like um, I think specifically um, with Moses and Elijah actually coming down on earth, this is not a instance, in fact, where, you know, somebody's a dead person is basically communicating to yeah. somebody on earth or whatever. I would say this is a special event that yeah. took place. And these guys came down in a physical form. And if somebody did come down in a physical form to me, I probably would talk to them, you know. So I, I don't think this is a, a – this necessarily is associated with praying to dead people or praying to saints yeah. and loved ones. So anyway. Okay. So I just I... – since this keeps getting brought up and this is on my mind i'm gonna i'm gonna make a moderator audible right now um can we all agree because here's the thing i don't think any of us would say whenever moses and elijah showed up on earth and they're talking to jesus right and and peter and and james and john are going to make altars to them i don't think any of us would say that there's a hard sense in which moses and elijah are dead but at the same time, I don't think we would all say um, that in a hard sense, and, I, and I'm emphasizing that, that Moses and Elijah are alive. Um, is, is there a way in which they could be both? Because here's the problem I'm having with this whole thing, right? Is that I don't see this whenever they transverse into heaven, they suddenly become dead. But then whenever they're here on earth, they're alive. I mean, they're speaking with Jesus. You know what I mean? And so I don't see this. Scripture doesn't allude to it, I, and, I, and I don't see it. It doesn't make sense to me that they would be dead in heaven but alive on earth, and then once they go back to heaven, now we consider them dead again. So my question for both of you is, can we say there's a sense in which they're both and, and, and maybe find some middle ground there? I mean, I think when we use the word dead, um, again, it's all a matter of perspective, right? They are dead in the sense mm -hmm. that they're not on this earth anymore. Uh, but yes, they are alive in the sense that their soul um, is still active, yeah. just not active in our physical plane. But in that sense, yeah. they were on this earth, right? Like yeah. they're here. Yeah, and, and and that's the thing is 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 what's what's really hard here, and this is my whole point is that we're taking this one event and trying to fit intercession of saints to it, and I just don't think that that's that's what the context we should be thinking about this in. I think right. we should be thinking about this event as a special event of where these guys come down to earth. And yeah. like Lewis said, and I agree with Lewis, um, there's a sense that these people are more alive than we are. Yeah. Um, and there's also a sense that, and, 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 and an appropriate sense of knowing that they are dead on this earth. And the, that's why the Bible says the dead in Christ shall arise first, because it's proper for us to speak that way of them as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think that would only apply to Moses, right? Because there's a sense in which Elijah never did face death. And so I right. think and there's also it, traditions that Moses' body was taken to heaven. So right. Well, assumption, oh. just like Mary and Jesus. Yeah. But 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 I guess the point I'm trying to make in all of this is that, no, <laughs> and I agree with David that I don't think, and Lewis, that I don't think that this is a text people go to uh, to argue for intercession of the saints. I think if anything, yeah. and given that this is a one-time event, I think if anything could possibly be made from this is is when we're talking about whether saints are alive yeah. or dead. My thing is, I don't, and, and David, you might like this, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to go with either black or white. Yeah. I think it's too, I think it, there's a gray area there in which yeah. we can't say hardly they're they're absolutely this but not this and vice versa that's this yeah. is my what yeah what it does prove at the very least is that you can't say that every form of communication between someone in heaven and someone on earth counts as necromancy i see i disagree with Fair that enough. so I, w I would disagree with that what i think it, it it does promote is that and and this is something i agree with you guys with is is i think it disproves soul sleep like we're mm -hmm. we're not we're not uh um when we pass we're not inactive in some s sort of way um i, I don't think, think we this would agree would... with that wouldn't we Lewis? yeah of course you should yeah, I, I, so. I would hope uh, so otherwise revelation I mean, six doesn't make sense at all 
I mean, yeah, go ahead. Next question. It's kind of a theological innovation. I don't know anyone prior to the Reformation who believed in it. Right. Right. Okay. Right on. All right. Troy is up next. And Lewis, you just let me know whenever you've got to stop. Um, do you have time for this I can one? I go over 4.30. Uh, okay. I'll just have to modify some of my plans. Okay. Well, you hey, let me know whenever you're ready to wrap up, and then we will. Right. Um, all right. With historical documents that record intercession of the saints as an acceptable belief practice prior to the New Testament and the church fathers, does this remove the corruption of early church as an argument? David, I'll let you go first on this one. With historical documents that record intercession of the saints as an acceptable belief. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think so. I don't think we have uh, historical documents that are t- uh, justifying us praying to, to, to the dead. Um, that's just my opinion. I don't think we have, uh, um, as far as a practice that, that may have been um, existent, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, there's, there's obviously Jews, there are some sects of Jews that believe that, that you could pray to a deceased loved one. But then again, there are sects that actually started bowing down to idols and worshiping idols and carrying idols into battle with them. And there, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, my whole point is that you don't find this in what is written. And so I would say to that argument, I would say, no, we have to study it all. We have to, we have to, I don't think it removes the corruption of the early church as an argument. So. Or maybe I'm just not understanding the question. Yeah. Well, All right. So here's the thing. I think that if someone posits corruption, the burden is on them to show that the thing they're asserting is a corruption it actually is a corruption. So um, David uh, has stated that these are corruptions, but he hasn't provided any hard evidence for that. Now, what would constitute hard evidence that intercession of the saints is a corruption? Um, you would have to show that um, non-Christian groups, such as the Greeks or the Gnostics, had a pra- had such a practice. Uh, you would have to show that the early Christians or Jews derived this practice from them, uh, and you or you can show that uh, the early church fathers were actively decrying this as a corruption. None of which is the case, as we have seen. Whoops. Hold on. I'm getting there, guys. Okay. Um, right on. All right. Yeah. Let's do let's do this one. Jamie asks, if, quote, into your hands I committed my spirit means you go to heaven, why did Jesus say that when his spirit went down and he didn't go to heaven until after he resurrected bodily? Lewis, I'll give that one to you first. I'll be honest. I have no idea where this is meant to go. Okay. Th- and uh, this might be one of those questions where I accidentally picked up that was actually being had with listeners. Uh, David, does it make any possibly. sense to you? It um, might be. It might be. I understand it from well, an apologetic aspect, but uh, yeah. Maybe if uh, Jamie Russell can clarify how that is... Uh, how that connects to the debate at hand, I might be able to make better heads or tails out of it. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, the only thing I'm going to say is that into your hands I commit my spirit doesn't mean Jesus' spirit went right up to heaven, but Jesus' spirit is in the hands of the Father, and the Father can direct him where he wills. If that means going to Hades for, for three days and three nights, as the Apostles' Creed uh, puts it, then so be it. Right. I, I, I don't have nothing. It has nothing to do with the intercession of saints. So. All righty. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. This is good. Um, Gia Bass, I've wondered if the harrowing of Hades and Christ rounding up all the saints in Abraham's bosom and taking them to paradise plays a role in the intercession of the saints. So, in other words, does Christ rounding up all the saints in Abraham's bosom and taking them to paradise play a role in the doctrine of the intercession of the saints? Lewis, I'll give this one to you first, and then David, um, if you want to comment on it. 
Now, now here's the interesting thing. I think I've thought about this a little bit. Um, remember Second Maccabees, where Onias and Jeremiah were interceding on behalf of the people of Israel. Mm-hmm. Where where were Onias and Jeremiah at that time? They would have been in Sheol, which means that even from Sheol, they could still intercede on behalf of uh, the saints on earth. And think about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Where is Abraham at that time? He's not in heaven. He's in Sheol, which means that Abraham as well is able to act on behalf of those on earth, even from Sheol. So um, does it play a role? Um, Maybe, but not in a practical sense, because even before they went up to heaven, the the Old Testament saints in Sheol were already interceding. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank yeah, I, I would. I OK, so as far as like I said, the Protestant doesn't have any problem with saints actually praying in heaven or doing anything. It's whether we should pray for them to pray for us and all and vice versa. So, I mean, that's that's where our problem is, is according to this question and how it how it uh, um, how it relates. I would just say I don't think it does. I, I don't think it has anything to do with uh uh, intercession of the saints um so okay yeah. all right um let's see okay question for david from disciple mike can saints can saints still on earth so earthly saints right now intercede on behalf of other brothers to god like how mary did at cana Are you, so is this meaning that uh, um, to pray for each other? That's the way I'm taking it. That's the way I'm taking it, too. Um, I think um, absolutely. I mean, we get that mm-hmm. command. Uh, uh, we get that command in throughout the Bible, especially when Paul says, you know, I would have you pray for the authorities. I'd have you pray for this. I'd have you pray for that. So, of course, that we're not talking about that. Um, we're, we're saying that, that definitely. By all means, you know, saints better pray for each other. But there's a status change when you go from this earth, earth to the next, and that's what we identify as Protestants. Okay, we've got two more questions, guys. So this has been fun. Uh, let's do let's do this one. Nah, I'll save that one for last. Um, since it's to David, I didn't want to give you two back to back. Faith unaltered uh, from Jamie would. Would they pray to saints before Jesus takes the spirits to heaven after the cross, as they say? Hold on. Do you guys get that I, I one? Like I, I think that's a variation of the previous question regarding uh, how the harrowing of Hades plays a role. Yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. I think that, yeah. It, 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 oh, okay. Relates. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that. Well, I'll, I'll let you guys. Which go. means um, it's the same answer as before. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Last question, and it is for David. Uh, David, Jews venerating and putting prayers in a wall. So I'm assuming modern day Jews that uh, the Welling Wall, right? Is that worshiping the wall? Well, there's a lot of things that go on at the uh, at the uh, um the the prayer wall there um so uh, like i said before and even in my opening i told you guys this that there are valid forms of veneration and even Luis agrees that there's valid forms of veneration and there uh um and i mean maybe we didn't get into it enough i don't know maybe Luis, do we get into it enough i, I maybe not um, it is a broad, broader topic. I think we we laid some groundwork, and maybe we can have another discussion on what constitutes these type of things and why it relates to intercession of the saints. But um, maybe, um, just maybe. But uh, no, I think that there are, are proper forms of worship. I think we have that clearly displayed in Hebrews chapter eleven as well. Um, also in other places uh, where Jesus talks about John the Baptist. Um, I mean, that's some very, very very um high praise from christ um but never does it does it involve prayer uh that's that that's where my the protestant stand would come from so um but yeah that's my answer lewis any follow-up uh i think we should definitely try to 
hammer out at what point does veneration cross over into worship? Uh, because I think that is the source of all the Protestant objections to the Catholic slash Orthodox position, because they see what we do as worship, whereas we don't see it that way. Um, and I, as I told you, from the Catholic perspective, we have a way of differentiating the two. So I guess it's up to David to say where he thinks the line should be and why um, the Catholic does not draw the line at the correct location. David, did you want to take that or? Oh no, I mean, I already answered my, that question. So no, Lewis is Lewis. Is oh question. no, I'm not gonna. Uh, you know, okay. this is question and answer time. He gives his answer, I give my answer. So, well, I'll, yeah, I'll like let you guys follow continue. up with each other. So, okay, all right, guys, that does it for this debate. Again, I want to thank Lewis and David for both participating in this. I there was one thing that stood out to my mind that I really. I really took hold of and maybe because it was such a big part of the discussion itself was uh, the, the the light, I guess, that shined on me this time was uh, really making really understanding that there's not a black and white uh, that we would like to make it sometimes uh, whenever it comes to saints, whether they are in heaven on earth. I don't think there's any question about saints on earth, but the ones that are in heaven are uh, possibly even uh, in Hades at this time or, or purgatory. Um, so I think that that is what really stood out to me personally. Now, whenever I go back and listen to this, um, I'm sure things will will jump out at me left and right. But but for me right now, that that's it. I don't think that we can. It, it's not either or. All right, they're not they're not dead, but they're not alive in the sense that we're alive. And in one sense, they're more alive than what we are. And so to make it black and white, to say that it's either or, I think it's a false dichotomy, uh, personally. That, that's just my uh, understanding of it right now. Uh, that's open for debate, I guess, um, because that's my opinion. But that's what stood out to me. And so that's kind of my, my closing thoughts. I, I really like the way uh, that Lewis and both David interacted. It was super cordial. Uh, I don't think there was a heated moment in this discussion, guys. And so for that, I thank you both. It didn't get crazy. Uh, it was exactly opposite of how we had some some of the episodes in the past. And so for that, I'm extremely, extremely thankful. Um, with that being said, um, I want to give you guys a chance to plug your channels. And whenever I say you guys, I mean Lewis, because, hey, we're watching this on David's channel right now. <laughs> so, Lewis, where can yeah. people find you if they want more of you? Um, yeah, so I am a regular, as I mentioned, on Michael Lofton's show. Uh, formerly known as Reason and Theology. Uh, I guess this is a good as good a time as any you mentioned this, but I'm getting my own sub channel within that channel. Nice. Uh, it's going to be called First Peter three. You know the verse where um, you have that passage which says, um, "Be ready to give a defense." And actually, I spoke to Michael about doing a debrief of this debate. Uh, and David is also invited to be on there. So if anyone wants to see some good follow-up on what we talked about today, uh, be sure to tune in tomorrow afternoon. Yep, right on. And send me a link to that, uh, Lewis, if you will, and I'll put that in the description so people can go find that tomorrow if they want to. All right. Uh, David, uh, and I, closing thoughts? And I would love to, Lewis, if I have a voice by, by the end of the day and I feel pretty good, um, because this medicine's pretty good, so I'm feeling okay right now. <laughs> you want to give the voice, secret? What are you my on voice, for? <laughs> hey, my voice is actually, if you can tell, it's been very weird. So mm -hmm. um, it actually is so weird that I can't, I stumble over my own words because hearing myself, it's different, you know, than what I'm used to even. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah just keep tuning into this show, guys. That's all I got to say. Yeah, amen, amen. And again, please like this, like this uh, video. At least it's been a pleasure. Likewise, I had fun. Right on, right on. So like like the show, like the episode, smash the like button, assault it. I don't care what you do to it, just make it blue. And uh, and we'll see you uh, next time. We've got some good shows coming up. I know the next time Lewis comes on uh, with us, we're going to be discussing New Testament and Old Testament textual criticism. That's something that we talked about even today. Um, uh, and, and we'll get that planned out and let you all know uh, when we plan on doing that, probably sometime in September, I think yeah. is what you said, Lewis. 
Yeah, if you want to see me get really nerdy and pedantic, um, just ask me a question about Old Testament textual criticism. Like, I get really into the weeds on that topic. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. So yeah. bring your weed boots, I guess. Uh, we're, we're Or machetes, at least. We're cutting down. Uh, but other than that, David, what do you have planned for Faith Unaltered for the month of August? Well, I spent all my time uh, preparing for this debate. So um, I have an open mic in August right now that I'm going to okay. fill because there are some topics that I want to discuss on the open mic and let people get involved with because okay. I did promise the audience that I wanted to do more of that. Mm -hmm. So um, other than that, other than the open mic that I've got going, I know we got something for the beginning of August. Yep. Um, yep. That's my so show. I want to do an open mic in the second week of August and kind of take the second week in the month to kind of maybe have fun, you know, and, and do a fun topic and stuff like that. So I've got a lot of ideas floating around and stuff like that, but um, I have nothing else on the horizon right now. OK, so that's August 11th at 7 p.m. Uh, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, we are doing an open mic. So bring your top. Anyone is invited to these things. So bring your topics. You will come on. If you don't want to, that's fine. You can ask us questions in the chat. But this is your opportunity to come on the show with us and talk to us about whatever you want to talk about. And let me tell you all, it can get really interesting really quick. Uh, so for that, David mentioned it, August 4th. So this is not next, uh, not next Friday, but the following Friday. We are having another debate-ish. It's it's not really a debate. It's an informal discussion where I've got uh, Father um, 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 John... Wow. John Whiteford. Sorry. Uh, Father John Whiteford uh, coming on Orthodox Priest uh, is going to dialogue um, with. Uh, why can't I remember these people's names? Uh, Lewis. Um, wow. Forgive me, guys. Uh, hold on. I'm going to find it now. David Lewis. Excuse me. So. That is happening. Father John White for David Lewis. Uh, David is on Apologetics uh, from the Attic. You can find that YouTube channel here on YouTube and on uh, Facebook. I believe he does Facebook Live broadcasts as well. Uh, so they are going to be talking about justification by faith alone. We've did the sola scriptura discussion, guys. Now we've did. Now we're doing the sola fide uh, discussion. So stick around for that. That's going to be fun. And then well, I don't know what else is coming in August. Um, we will uh, we'll see soon. So I don't even know what's coming uh, the rest of the week in August. Uh, Josh will make a um, video, I'm sure. Uh, him and Dane just did a, a good video on the end of philosophical materialism. That was that was really good. And so I encourage people to go watch that. But other than that, y'all, it's been fun. It's been great. Good night. God bless. And please, for the love of Christ, stay like Christ.